What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Allbach, and welcome to the show. Uh, it's been a long time since I've uploaded a new episode. Things have been busy on the career front, I'll say, and uh, crazy on the COVID front for, for everybody, obviously. But um, I've got some real insightful folks lined up to speak with in the next couple months, so I'm excited to get back in to the, the swing of talking with people in this format again. So uh, yeah, let's just uh, get into it for today. Uh, for this episode, I spoke with the up-and-coming political YouTuber, Akano Boy. Uh, Akano Boy identifies as a social democrat and progressive, and most of his content is centered around economics, but he also debates and discusses uh, various cultural issues with figures on both the left and the right. And uh, personally, uh, as someone who's been consuming political content on YouTube for uh, almost 10 years, uh, I think, at this point, I've been super impressed with his range of economic knowledge, uh, particularly on a global scale, um, especially for someone like me who's a, a complete layperson on, uh, on the issues. So, um, yeah, in, in our conversation, we got into various critiques of capitalism from a leftist perspective and of social democracy uh, in particular, which is the, the sort of broad ideological framework in which uh, both of us uh, really operate with them. So we spent the, the first half digging into the nuances of language and identity between leftists and capitalists and like, like we defined um, the, the differences between socialists and social democrats, which can, I think, get really in the weeds with people, especially online. So then we got into just various critiques and defenses of social democracy in particular. And um, I will say I, I could have gone for hours talking about this, and I know he can as well, and he has in the past. So there were several critiques of both capitalism and socialism that we didn't get into. So if you're interested in hearing more of his views, just check out his YouTube channel, and chances are he's covered uh, whatever you're thinking. Um, but yeah, throughout the whole conversation, there's this emphasis on rhetoric and messaging, which is something he does really well, uh, especially when facing political opponents. Um, he has this way of staying very temperamentally calm and polite, while also not being afraid to, to make jabs or jokes as needed. So very refreshing in this space online. And um, yeah, I'll have uh, his YouTube channel and other resources linked in the show notes. So definitely check him out. And if you've got any feedback for either of us, we're both uh, pretty accessible on social media, particularly uh, Twitter, Discord, and uh, YouTube. So yeah, all that said, uh, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Now let's get into what's really good. Kano boy, thank you for coming on the show and chatting. Thanks for having me. It's going to be a good time. The best of times. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super grateful that uh, you, you took the time to, to do this. I've been a big fan of the content you've been producing the past year or so on YouTube, both in your... Oh, really? Big fan. What's your favorite video? <laughs> Name your top five songs. Um, I think the, the video that really got my attention beyond just uh, the kind of debates and AMA styles that you've been doing was actually your video on uh, social democracy and the um, the global south and just the kind of response to that leftist critique of um, does social democracy require imperialism or colonialism? And I feel like I hadn't seen that critique and response to that critique uh, just sorted out in the way that you did. I thought it was like really precise and very empirical, so I, I, that that really drew me into a lot of your content. All right, you've you've passed the test. I thought you were a poser at first. <laughs> this guy. All right. I've been binging it. You can ask uh, my wife. I'm I obnoxiously walk around the house. I have AirPods, which I just got as a gift recently. But I even with them, I still go around the house listening with my iPhone speakers. So she's been a uh, getting a crash course and <laughs> <laughs> for your content. Um, yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't convince my own wife to watch my videos. So, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's 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 tough. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rough, but it's good. It's great stuff, um, and I've been recommending it to everybody I talk to in the sort of you know hobbyist political space who who consumes you know comparable stuff around economics and social issues, which I know you've been dipping into as well a bit. So I'm excited to kind of go through this because my thought process in, in interviewing you or kind of having a conversation is I want to kind of do three things and they'll all sort of meld together. Um, I guess the, the broad the broad mission here is obviously the case for social democracy. I know you identify um, as a social democrat, which we can get into and you can kind of explain in depth what that means to you. Um, and the, But I also want to kind of do that from the perspective, from a critical perspective, you know, kind of going through some of the more prominent critiques of social democracy from a leftist perspective, and also just kind of general critiques of capitalism, which kind of interweave um, with social democracy as kind of a subset of capitalism. So to kind of, to, I guess just to get us started off, uh, do you just want to kind of go through your worldview and how you identify economically and what these uh, terms mean to you? Yeah, sure. So I pretty much am, I would call myself a capitalist uh, because I don't really believe in total collective ownership of the means of production. Um, you know, some sometimes it makes good, but as an absolute rule, I think that's where you run into problems. And because uh, obviously we'd all agree with some collective ownership, like most people would agree that, you know, we probably need a military that's state run, right? Um, collectively run under a democratic framework, right? Uh, same thing with, you know, uh, police or firefighters, you know, very, very basic things we can all typically agree on, even conservatives. Um, and uh, but again, as an absolute rule, I think it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, and worker ownership is very similar, right? There's nothing wrong with worker ownership intrinsically. It's really just a matter of, you know, do you mandate it? Is it a requirement of of, of business operation? That's kind of why I would consider myself a, a capitalist. And in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the different sort of you know, policy positions, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to talk a lot about the things that get talked about a lot online. Uh, and so that tends to be, you know, healthcare, uh, immigration, right. Uh, f fiscal policy, right. You know, how much debt and stuff like that should we have, which a whole range of, of views on that one, uh, environmental policy, you know, stuff like that, just, you know, the, the, the stuff that people tend to talk about. And that to be fair is also what I am most interested in. So it kind of works out. Cool. Yeah, and we'll get into some of that along the way. I guess just to kind of take a couple minutes just going through the label of social democracy and how that fits within the U.S. political spectrum versus the global political spectrum. Because I feel like for people who are extremely online and, you know, follow online politics to, to a certain degree, I mean, obviously, the deeper you go, you can kind of like, you get into these weird subcultures where everybody has like the, the most hyper specific label of like, you know, I'm a, I'm a Marxist Leninist with Maoist tendencies or, you know, what, whatever it might be. And you get, it gets pretty weird and esoteric. So I think it's helpful for me to kind of map out when I talk about these issues, like what social democracy means to me and how I see it, because obviously there's socialists who will use social democratic countries and policies to kind of like defend their positions and be like, oh, well, this is a leftist thing, you know, look at the Nordic countries for this thing. And then capitalists on the, the right or kind of center right will do the same thing, like they'll try to claim social democracy. So I guess like when you look at the current US political spectrum, in kind of comparison to the rest of the world, like how do you where do you view social democracy or social democrats uh, on that spectrum? In, in terms of world politics, I would say social democracy is left of center. Um, and in terms of is it far left or center left, it kind of just depends on the country, you know, of course, right? The social democrats in Germany are kind of just the center left party. They're not like radically to the left. Um, same thing with the Nordic economies, stuff like that. Um, sometimes there's coalition agreements that happen, but it, it, it seems broadly the case that amongst developed economies, which I'm most familiar in, in terms of the political interactions there, and it's, it's most consistent, uh, social democracy tends to be a center-left ideology. And with within the U.S. framework, I would say, economically speaking, social democrats would be considered probably, I would call it, um, not. I, I still wouldn't call it far left, right? Um, because economically, I'm not sure if, 
I'm probably not quite as far left as like Bernie Sanders, guy who probably would be considered the farthest left in sort of current relevant American politics. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's that's how I would describe it in general. Right. It's it's a capitalist sort of it's 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 a way to manage capitalism that's sort of altruistic in nature uh, in such a way that we take advantages of the sort of gains of private investment and market oriented economics and uh, try to distribute them as fairly as you can whilst at the same time encouraging development and entrepreneurship in the first place. And I think there's economies that have done that better or worse. Um, you know, to some extent you can consider almost every developed country and almost every country in general, social democracy, if, if all it requires is some redistribution under a market framework, but obviously there's probably a, a relevant spectrum there. And, um, you know, the, the economies that I would tend to look at as good models would be the Nordic economies. Uh, specifically, I think if I had to pick one, probably Norway would be, would be my, my number one, but you know, there's, there's a lot of good policies in a lot of these countries that I think, uh, we could stand to learn from in the United States or, or Canada, or even if you're in Europe, obviously it just depends on the, the, the country. Yeah. Yeah. I'd sign off on, on pretty much all of that. I guess it gets tricky too, because obviously when you start talking to people that are more right leaning anything left of, you know, like a centrist Hillary Clinton and even Hillary or Obama, in some cases, they would just call them socialists anyway. But pretty much anything, you know, left of center is socialist, leftist, communist, whatever. So it's kind of hard to <laughs> it's, it's, there's almost no point in even grappling with that criticism. But in terms of um, yeah. from a leftist position, it gets interesting just because I know not just online, but just in, le in leftist circles in general, there's this kind of difference in mindsets of, you know, where does the split from leftism into capitalism start? Because some more radical leaning leftists will say that leftism by definition has to be anti-capitalist. So that includes social democracy as a kind of, you know, capitalist framework, even though it has more social policies and programs within it. Um, but then there's other people on the left who identify as leftists who will say, well, social democracy has a critique of capitalism, you know, and it's actively trying to reform and kind of undermine capital interests. So there's certain leftists who will say social Democrats fit within the leftist umbrella. But like, how do you how do you think about that? Because obviously, so a lot of people who would listen to your content would essentially equate you with a socialist because you you mentioned Bernie. I mean, you, I think, stand by most policy, uh, you know, propositions from Bernie, I mean, maybe barring like rent control and, and some of the more uh, radical, maybe some of the more radical elements of his health care plan. I'm not sure. You, you can feel free to get into that. But um, obviously, you, you call yourself a capitalist, but it kind of is this weird thing, because I know based on the, the sort of policy prescriptions you have, you clearly have a critique of capitalism, but you're still kind of working within the system. So how do you view the kind of like leftist uh, tension there with these labels between leftism and capitalism? I mean, every this is this is something that is is not new, really. I mean, mo most most economists and economic thinkers are pretty willing to recognize that there's problems with with market distribution of goods and services, depending on the market, and that government influence has uh, the potential to have a very negative and positive impact on the economy and on well-being. Um, you know, if if uh, depending on on the situation, right? I mean, in your in your first day of a macroeconomics course, you're probably going to learn about how uh, the market outcome isn't always the socially optimal outcome. That's like one of the first lessons you'll learn. Pollution is a very classic example where, you know, the the market might be uh, incentivized to literally pollute end endlessly a river um, because of all the associated you know sort of behavioral reasons why that's the case and. Um, whilst the market might clear to a certain extent, whilst profits might be high, that's not a socially optimal outcome. So it's not a new thing, right? And um, it is kind of annoying when you you see some people being like, I, I never learned about negative externalities in my economics education. It's like, I don't know where you went to school then. Because I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I didn't go to some fancy schmancy, you know, $100,000 for my degree school, right? Right. Um, it's not new, these kinds of critiques, right? Fundamentally. And when it comes to the idea that, oh, well, 
you know, you, basically, if you're going to consider yourself on the left, you need to have an anti-capitalist bend. I don't understand that, really. That doesn't really seem to be a very historical take on the left-right spectrum. Obviously, when it comes to the left-right spectrum, there's even... It, it's it's almost more like, um, you know, it's it's like... The left-right spectrum, it's like how you, how you first learn what an electron is and what an atom looks like, and you get, like, the, you know, the... Uh, what's it called? The, the Not the Punnett square, the... Um, uh, the the it's not a Venn diagram Myra, but basically like you get that sort of basic model of a of a diagram of a of an atom and then you eventually go into your undergraduate education in physics and you might learn like oh no there's this weird amorphous thing called the electron cloud and that's kind of what we understand electrons to be and how they're oriented with atoms and it's more complicated than that and I think idea political ideology is very similar where you know a standard you know left right sort of spectrum it's pretty easy for most people to grasp, but it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think that, you know, saying that everyone on the, if you're going to call yourself on the left, you have to be anti-capitalist in nature. I mean, that just, you know, what, what do you mean by that? Does that really make any sense? And, uh, if you're, if you're talking about fundamentally the critique of capitalism and market oriented economics, I mean, you don't, most economists don't advocate for a privatized military, right? right. Now, why is that? Well, it's because the market probably wouldn't work, and most economists would recognize that, right? And and most economic thinkers would recognize that too. So, you know, if 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 critiquing capitalism is a primary component of the left, almost everyone on the left, including people on the right, would critique capitalism. You know, right wingers right. will say, right "Oh, capitalism." Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, right wingers will say, "Oh, capitalism is terrible." Look at all these tech companies censoring everyone, and look at all these woke corporations doing this and that. We need the government to do this and that. Like, everyone has their own critiques of capitalism. It's just a matter of do you think we should throw out the entire system of basically private investment and organization, right? If that's a component, a necessary component of being on the left, um, well, then frankly, almost no governing um, authority is is leftist. At least they don't act like it, right? Um, you know, the people that call themselves socialists that are in government uh, don't tend to just want to completely get rid of all sort of market mechanics and completely collectivize the ownership of the means of production, right? So, you know, I just think there's a reasonable give and take. I think a lot of people on the left and the right are probably uh, detrimentally absolutist in, in how they would would view, you know, their ideology. Like, for instance, uh, I, I got in a debate with someone who said that, um, you know, really, I think I think really definitionally, definitionally, you are a socialist, Econo Boy, to which I said, well, look, I really don't think so, um, but I don't really care. Right. Because right. if we can agree on the prescriptions, which in that conversation we happened to, then look, if you want to call the finish line something different, then that's totally fine. Um, and that's a good realization to come to for most people, because, you know, who who cares what you call it? For me, just call it whatever is sort of most politically advantageous uh, or what you think is a proper labeling. And for me, you know, a proper labeling is I'm a capitalist that thinks there's problems and you know, to me, it just just makes sense to go from there, right? Uh, get a little bit more uh, kumbaya, I guess, in your in your movement, guys. I mean, stop <laughs> arguing about all these petty definitions and whatnot. Good goodness. Yeah, it's very. I mean, classically in group, out group oriented. Um, and I and I guess the the tricky thing is is that basically what you said I agree with in terms of I I find it much more productive to identify you know prescriptive ideas and solutions to, to policies and general cultural problems to be a much simpler and more effective uh, means to communicate politically, just figure out, you know, like what, what is it that you're prescribing here versus what I'm prescribing and let's sort out the differences. Um, I guess just to ha like to harp on this just for a few more moments, I mean, I guess like the weird thing about, I'm, yep. sure, I'm sure you're kind of starting to really see some of these threads, you know, untangle the, the more popular you get on YouTube, the more active you get in these political subcultures, because you realize that that isn't the popular stance. Like the popular stance isn't let's just figure out policy prescriptions and argue about which are the most empirical or, or effective or what have you. The more popular stance is what is your label it, who is your team? You know, do I identify with that label or that team? And it's tricky because, like you said, so much of that, what I've found, doesn't necessarily even come down to policy prescriptions. It often comes down to just the kind of, I mean, to, to put to put it weirdly, I mean, to your vibes, like to how how you come across and like who you spend time with, who you're willing to like who you're willing to associate with, what your audience is like you know, what you spend more or less time talking about. Like, I think 
from a lot of leftist perspectives, just the fact that you're willing to produce some level of content, you know, critiquing socialism as an economic model or, you know, defending social democracy from these critiques of, you know, it, it, does it have to be imperialist or, or what have you? Just the fact that you do that is enough for certain people on the left to just like completely count you out and say, all right, well, this person is clearly spending their time propping up capital interests, so I have no interest allying with them, even if, you know, you align with 94% of the policy prescriptions that they, they might be fighting for. So it's this really strange hurdle to overcome both online and just in real life in general. Like people have this tendency to want to identify, you know, are you with me or are you against me? Even though oftentimes the the policy or like the just general uh, prescriptions that you might have, you know, to the world you want to build will line up, like you said, almost identically, even if their end point is like a couple steps further, say like a socialist being like, you know, I think social democracy is not enough. We should achieve socialism after that. It's like, okay, well, let's say in theory, we get most of the developing countries in the world to adopt some social democratic mo economic model in the next 100 years. Who cares, you know, if 100 or 200 years after that, we evolve into some kind of socialist model? Like that's in the near term with what we're all trying to accomplish, we should be relatively on the same side here, but it has to become this, you know, identity issue, which is really tricky to navigate. Yeah, I mean, we we can obviously argue on the prescriptions, and I would like. There's a lot of people that would call themselves socialists that I would have arguments on with prescriptions, and there's a lot of people that would call themselves capitalists, and we'd have we'd have you know arguments, but they're very different arguments. It just depends on the issue, and um, it's not that labels are totally useless, right? In terms of conferring some sort of predetermined, um, uh, you know, I I think w w the purpose of a label, I think, in terms of a political ideology, I think, is often that if you tell someone what your ideology is, they should roughly be able to understand what your thoughts are on a thing. Like it allows them to frame how you would view the world. Now there's obviously nuances, but that's the utility generally of, of really any label and especially political labels. Right? So for instance, if someone says I'm a neo-Nazi and then another person says I'm a socialist, right? Well, I'm probably going to have roughly and immediately a clear distinction in my head between what these two people think about assorted issues, right? If we start talking about, you know, immigration, right? I probably can differentiate these two people based on their ideology, right? Um, now, it obviously depends, but you get what I'm saying. Um, now, the disutility comes in the form of, look, guys, if we agree on basically if if you view uh as the uh, the OGS social democrats did if you view social democracy as just a road to socialism right where you slowly collectivize more and more things and more unionization more worker empowerment and eventually you do socialism and then eventually you do communism if that's your goal well then whatever let's just let's get down the road and then we can fight and kill each other right <laughs> but we're not even down the road yet okay right. i mean let's just agree that certain things should be done and then you know, once I'm truly on the far right being a social Democrat, because it's just social Democrats and socialists left, you know, let, 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 let's fight at that point. But we've got a couple generations that need to go by <laughs> before that's the case. And any sort of exclusionary stuff just seems a, a little weird to me. It depends. You know, safe spaces make some sense sometimes. But, yeah, I think generally I would agree that, you know, it, it's um, it, it does seem a little weird how reflexive some socialists and, and uh, can get with regard to the. Uh, that you're, you're sort of your 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 membership in a in a certain group right it's, yeah. it does seem a little bit odd and and it's it's a shame too because they often you know and i everybody does this to an extent i guess but they'll often pull the you know the classic mott and bailey philosophy technique you know or like they'll depending on the conversation they're having or the group they're talking to they might open up with much more revolutionary um positions on something like, I mean, obviously the past couple of years, we've seen various slogans, you know, from abolish and defund the police to, you know, people on the left who are really adamantly, you know, for Bernie's Medicare for all model and like saying something like a public, like even during like the 2020 primaries, like saying like a, or a lot of the, the Democratic uh, candidates were say, talking about public option, how a lot of leftists were saying, well, that's not even far enough. And it's like, 
I agree to, to what you're saying. I mean, obviously, there's certain leftists who will spend a certain degree of energy, you know, pushing that kind of like revolutionary policy language. It's not even really policy language, I guess. It's more just literally, you know, upheave the whole system. But then often, you know, if they're talking to someone else or they're trying to convert or whatever, you know, the language gets a lot more flowery and soft. They're like, oh, no, we're not like really going to rise up and seize the means of production. You know, we want to be more like Norway or whatever. And it's in, it's that that can be frustrating for me because I feel like especially with trends online you know kind of being at the point where they are today where a lot of young people find socialism and leftism generally just to be kind of like the trendy new ideology like comparably to years ago I'm sure I don't know how long you've been online but I mean 2014-15 when the whole anti-SJW craze was you know everywhere on YouTube and Reddit and Twitter and that was just like, yeah. and that, that's kind of, to be honest, that's kind of, that was my, really my intro into that, this space, which was a weird period um, for me, kind of just like kind of sorting out, you know, what my beliefs were um, politically and, and socially. But it's weird to think back, even for me as a person in my early 20s in that period, being like, just trying to navigate all of it, because there's so much just trendy group think you know among these kind of fighting groups of people on youtube and reddit and twitter or whatever and it's the same thing today where it's like you see all these socialist creators on twitch or youtube or tiktok or whatever and it's difficult i feel like to navigate especially for young, for young people because they're being fed kind of both sides to that coin and it feels like the people in your shoes who are very concisely and clearly you know advocating for social democracy as a framework saying, hey, you know what, I'm a capitalist, but these are all the issues I see with unfettered capitalism. This is the sort of model that I would that I would like to see us move toward. It feels like it, that position is very rare. And it's unfortunate because like that, to me, it has all of the sort of um, radical elements, you know, when you when you think about like the particularly the US political spectrum, where it is now, I mean, obviously, we don't have a universal healthcare model or free education or all some, a lot of these more uh, more strong welfare policies that some of the Nordic countries have. So we have like a lot to work for there. And the U.S. is a very individ individualistic and right-leaning culture when it comes to guns and free speech and anti-government. So a lot of the social democratic positions are radical enough, I feel, that if I were like, a 14 year old or an 18 year old kind of growing up right now, if I had someone like you to relay that information to me, I'd be like, yeah, this all makes total sense. But it sucks that the more like revolutionary, just kind of out there and unempirical ideologues who are pushing, you know, this kind of vague talk of revolution and seizing the means of production, it just so happens to be so much more sexy. Uh, for people, which is difficult to grapple with. So, like, how do you, obviously, I know you think about this because you're uh, trying to communicate and be a public figure in this space. I mean, how do you navigate that as someone who really you, you have, I mean, relatively radical politics, you know, on a U.S. Uh, basis, but you're obviously not seen as that online. You're almost seen as a moderate by a lot of these people. Well, the, 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 how moderate your opinions are is going to be dictated. I mean, it's a social construct, right? So, I mean, with regard to, Twitter, um, I really am. I'm just center left, really, I would say, right? I'm not, I'm not far left in a Twitter space, right? Because of what you just said. Now, anybody who says they want to violently overthrow the government uh, deserves to be made fun of because that's stupid, right? And it's not going to happen, right? And, uh, it, it, you know, there, there has never been, in the history of wealthy liberal democracies, there has never been a revolution or a coup ever now why is that right is that because of whatever nonsense oh you know your manufactured consent and all this no nothing like that part of it is that most people are generally pretty happy with the system itself right we might have some problems day to day with our government we might vote for one party over another but most people aren't really in such a destitute situation that they want to overthrow the government in liberal democracies, right? In, in, in wealthy liberal democracies, I should say. Right. And two, I just, I, 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 I would, I, I would call into question the constitution of people who say they want to do that and, and whether that constitution would actually, sh uh, 
uh, show itself in in the midst that they got such an opportunity. Um, because it's it's one thing to say on a tweet that you 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 think you know a, a, an overthrow of the government is is the only answer. It's another thing to actually do anything about it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I'm reminded, for instance, of a of a time when I heard uh, Ben Shapiro once say. Uh, I think it was in response to Beto saying he wanted to take everyone's AR-15 away or something like that. Yep. And he said, um, Ben Shapiro said, he was like, well, you know, if a government agent comes into my house and says that they're going to take my gun, um, I have uh, one uh, of two options. OK, I can either give him my gun or I can grab my butt gun I can, or I can grab my gun. Those are the two options. And it's like, OK, Ben, let me just say this. Don't mean to be rude. I don't think you're the one that's going to be shooting at the police if they come to take your guns away. Okay, <laughs> let's just be real here. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't advocate for you getting your guns taken away or anything like that. But don't pretend to be tough guy. Okay, that annoys me because you're not tough guy. Uh, and it's just kind of weird and awkward uh, for you to say something like that. Right. And I feel very similarly with the revolutionary left. Um, but with the reformist socialists, I mean, that's where more of this sort of esoteric debate kind of gets counterintuitive where you know look guys i mean we actually agree on most things right and 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 let's just go from there in terms of you know how how it can be frustrating to um i suppose to deal with the lack of nuance in public discourse i guess that was part of the reason why i started my channel to try in some small part uh to, to try in some small way to um tr try and counter that sort of lack of nuance and, and try to inject some nuance and some economic discourse in a, in a scene, which is um, incredibly reactionary and incredibly sort of void of, of nuance, um, uh, very void of unsatisfying answers, which is oftentimes what you get when you inject nuance, right? Is <laughs> sometimes it's just not a very satisfying thing, um, but it's necessary uh, because you want to be correct and you want to be, you know, right and righteous with what you're advocating for. Right. Um, and, uh, so, you know, all you can do is play your small part and have those conversations with either your family. You don't have to create a YouTube channel like I do, but, you know, uh, it just, just trying to be more understanding and, and explanatory when, when people have these sort of more radical viewpoints, everyone who has a radical viewpoint, it originates from somewhere. Um, and it's almost always going to originate from a genuine place, right? I mean, I assume that there's not like, there's probably some people who are just like, this is just the way for me to get power eventually. Right. right. But let's just be real. Most people just see some ailments in society and they end up falling down. Um, what is, you know, kind of a more reactionary, you know, rabbit hole. It seems like people are kind of predisposed to reactionary, uh, you know, reactionary ism, whatever you'd call it. Um, and it seems like that's true across pretty much every culture and every moment in time, depending on what you're looking at. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the best thing to do isn't necessarily call them, you know, dumb or idiots or anything like that, but you know, uh, ho hopefully you can just try and talk to them on a human level and get them to grasp the, the data. Uh, something that I think that destiny and Vosh have spoken to is the idea that when you're talking to someone in a public matter, uh, in a public manner, I should say, um, your goal isn't necessarily to convince the person you're talking to, especially if it's another content creator. Your goal is to try and present an opposition to that person that is convincing to their audience uh, who is watching, right? So if you're, if you're debating like Ben Shapiro, uh, you should never be under the sort of, you know, you should never be under the assumption that he's at all willing to change his position because he's probably not because you're probably not going to convince him and even if he was be able to be convinced by you, he has a lot of incentive to not even express it. So your goal really with a conversation like that is to try and present to the Ben Shapiro fans of the world that actually what he's saying is ridiculous and it's not evidentiary most of the time. And, you know, pointing out these rhetorical tricks here and there. And hopefully you can uh, crack that armor um, and convince people to to have a little bit more, more depth in their opinion. Um, some good examples of this might be I think I think a lot of people felt that way when Destiny debated Richard Wolf, mm. where he didn't really come off very good in that debate. Richard Wolf didn't, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of other examples, but there's probably a plethora of examples of basically people debating people that was strategically kind of a mistake. Um, I can think of one example. One more example was um, when 
uh, William Lane Craig debated Shelley Kagan. And when William Lane Craig debated, uh, I think his name is Stephen Carroll, the physicist, oh, Sean right? Carroll. Maybe it's Sean Carroll. Yeah. The physicist. It's mm-hmm. like there, you know, those were strategic errors for him because he looked like a fool because he, he thought to himself, you know what? Let's have a physics debate with a physicist. <laughs> now I get it. I'm a philosopher, but I'm prepared for this. And he, he ends up getting demolished and it was clear. He didn't really understand anything he was talking about. And so that was a very effective debate from uh, Sean Carroll's side, not because he convinced William Lane Craig to think any differently, but because he probably showed to the people, uh, he probably showed to the audience of William Lane Craig that, uh, well, this person's positions aren't as well thought out as, as uh, he might have led you to believe. And so, that's uh, what you're trying to prevent in a debate and uh, uh, what you're trying to prevent from your own side. And that's what you're trying to do to the other person if you feel like their ideas are really, really bad. Right. And like you said, it kind of, a lot of that goes toward the sort of platform and audience differences as well. Like with the Destiny Richard Wolf example, I think a lot of what tripped Richard Wolf up in that debate, I mean, these were talking points and, and, and debates that he's been having, you know, his, essentially his entire career. And he went into that debate in that sort of lecture mode of, you know, I'm going to because, you know, he's done a lot of these kind of monk style debates with, you know, or like Reason Magazine or, or Intelligence Squared, you know, where they've got like the Oxford style introduction and all that. And he's used to this kind of here's my three points right. and expand on them. Very and formal debate. Very formal. basically. Right. But, he, and, but yeah. he, he's also he's also communicated to other online public figures who are, are more casual. But I think knowing it was the debate format on this subject that he's kind of spent so much time breaking down when he was met with someone replying, you know, to the the sort of details of that critique, I think, like you said, because most of his audience coming from the socialist perspective were watching, I think, somebody probably for the first time from a left-leaning perspective break down some of those those arguments, you know? Because, I mean, obviously, like I said, we were talking about earlier in the conversation, right-wing caricatures are easy to dismiss there's not a whole lot you can do to argue on on you know empiric grounds but in terms of you know from a left-leaning perspective when you have somebody somebody like richard wolf who's trying to like define the the terms of socialism and in his definition he's including social democracy in that and then you're like you start this kind of esoteric debate of like well isn't social democracy democracy capitalism and that kind of breaks down a lot of just the the sort of structure in which he's used to presenting these ideas. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. It is interesting to consider that. And I I think it's important when kind of breaking down some of these critiques, because like we're saying, I mean, obviously it's a lot of young people in particular who are attracted to this stuff. And, you know, when I, whenever I see, I get really frustrated because like, I'll see whether it's TikTok or Twitter or wherever, you know, these, these posts that are like, you know, my dog died today. Thanks capitalism. You know, it'll be just some (laughs) name, name the problem. And and the the reason that this problem exists is capitalism, and it's just it's become a, a meme essentially. But I think a lot of people mean that, and I think the sort of well-meaning aspect of that, like you touched on earlier, is just the fact that people's material conditions are kind of in upheaval currently. I mean, not just within the pandemic, which is obviously kind of expediting uh, all these problems, but you know, with rising levels of income inequality and uh, student loan debt, and you know, the kind of like weird changing landscape of job prospects and how a lot of young people feel, you know, that they don't have a future working in the field they, they would have wanted to work in, or they're not going to get paid what they thought they were going to get paid to work in that field. And you kind of get this sense of dread, especially online where it's so heavily concentrated. So I do think it is important to acknowledge that, which, like you said, you can essentially build that case out for really any ideology. I mean, whether it's someone from the far right or the far left, and you, you, you find this disenfranchisement of, of people, which often leads to extreme ideologies because people are desperate and they see desperation around them, whether, and even if they're not desperate, even if they come from a more lucky or privileged background, you know, they see climate change looming in the future and they, they are looking for the kind of simple uh, solution or the simple problem to identify with because it makes to them, the kind of uh, synthesis of, of how they're going to like operate in the world become simpler, which is weird because I guess to me, a lot of um, the semantics that we're kind of going through here, 
to me, the importance of breaking that down is to get into those more precise definitions and those more precise uh, causes of these problems, because then you can really solve for them. You know, like when you start talking about X problem is because of capitalism, it's like, well, what is the prescriptive solution to that? And obviously, for some of these leftists, they'll just say, well, the only solution is revolution, which is like, there's not a whole lot to work with in there, man. I mean, like people have been calling for revolution in various countries the past century plus, and it often doesn't happen. And often when it does, all the time when it happens, it's a bloody disaster and, and you know, thousands or millions of people die. So it's this kind of, it puts us in a weird position where, yeah, we do have to kind of be sensitive when approaching these critiques. But at the same time, like you hinted at, you also want to be entertaining and sharp and witty because if you're not engaged in the sort of language and, and the fun of the culture, whether it's debate culture or making clever video essays, no one's going to hear you anyway. So it's a really tricky thing for you to navigate, which, um, yeah, I'm just interested to, to listen more and, and learn more about how you're kind of figuring that out. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's, it's a, it can be a moving target. I mean, obviously the, you know, the Overton window is a real thing, right? And so you, you, uh, battles tend to, to transition, right? So it's, it seemed like, uh, for, for instance, for, uh, it, there, there seemed to be relatively clear sort of not dividing lines, but there, there was definitely waves of certain sort of civil issues that people brought up. So obviously there was a civil rights movement in the 1960s and, uh, or we can go all the way back to slavery, right? You know, it's, slavery was a big issue ever since it started to when it ended. And, from then, from that point on, it was okay. Well, um, what does integration look like? And basically, for like a hundred years, the debate was, you know, how, how to how, how do we properly and, and righteously integrate uh, these former slaves and, and and descendants of these enslaved people uh, into society? And what does that look like? Right? Are they allowed to vote? Are they allowed to live in the same neighborhoods? Right? Are they allowed to access the same public resources? Right? And uh, then. At that point, it was it became more of a, a sort of well, how, how do we empower this group, right? Because they've been so far behind for so long, right? How do we how do we uh, catch them in aggregate up to where uh, to to parity with the sort of dominant class in society? Then you you know you you started to get this trickling of the uh, gay rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, and it, and it really started to take hold in the 90s, in the 2000s, and the 2010s, and then once everyone kind of decided that gay marriage was, you know, gay marriage ended up being completely legalized across the country and sort of by law in a lot of respects, gay people have been moved to parity, um, except for, I think there's cases where like a em employer discrimination is kind of another big fight with the gay community. But then a big conversation, it transitions to, well, what about trans people, right? We all kind of agree that gay people deserve equal rights. Okay. We, we agreed also on black people and, and people of color as well, right? What about trans people, though? I mean, come on, right? We really, you know, and now that's a big part of, uh, you know, trans issues have always been an issue in society, right? It's just that they, they, they seem to only have gotten talked about recently because the right wing has sort of used, now that's their wedge issue, yep. right? It used to be, could black people vote, right? Uh, it used to be, could black people use the same water fountain as my kid, right? It used to be, um, you know, should, should you be able to fire someone for being black? It used to be gay marriage and gay rights and the extension of civil liberties to gay people, right? And now it's, well, uh, should trans women be able to, to compete in the women's category of sport? Um, what should government policy look like in regard to paying for transition? Should they be allowed in the military? And these are all ultimately losing issues. Um, and in the long term, these social issues ended up becoming, uh, I, I think, it, it just moves on to the next thing. Oftentimes it, it seems to be the case and it'll probably be the case that, you know, when I'm, you know, when I'm 70 years old, I wonder, I wonder what social issues I'll be the conservative on. Right. It'll be interesting <laughs> to see. Cause I don't know. Right. It's impossible to tell. Right. But, um, that tends, that tends to be what happens in with regard to, um, uh, you know, dealing, dealing with that over time can be, uh, a little frustrating because it leads to people who, um, just, you know, the people who I don't think are the most good faith with regard to talking to you, it seems like, you know, I've, I've got other means that I'm concerned about. And so I'm going to use these wedge issues to get an advantage. Right. So, for instance, like, I don't really think that conservative politicians care that much about CRT. Mm -hmm. Right. 
it just can't be the number one issue for like most conservative politics. I can't imagine that as as soon as uh, he he might already be in office. I'm not sure, but you know, I can't, I can't imagine that um you know as as soon as Glenn Youngkin and the Republican legislatures uh, legislators in Virginia take office, they're going to immediately act to ban CRT and do all this crazy stuff. Like no, they've probably got other things on their platform they care more about, but. That's the wedge issue that they can, they feel like can inspire their base to get out and vote in the Red first beef. place, right? So, yeah, sort of, right? I mean, it's it's uh, you know, so that can be a, a little frustrating, especially seeing how certain politicians that I might like deal with that kind of thing, right? Where you know, it's it's like, man, I feel like the strategy for how to handle this sort of uproar about the situation was was mishandled. So, yeah, yeah. it's it's an interesting thing to navigate. Yeah, that that is one area in which I think a lot of leftists have a good critique of the culture wars as being just largely a, a distraction away from, you know, material policies that impact people's lives, you know, whether it is wages or health care or education or what have you, it's like those become on the, they just become back burner issues for the average American because what they get fed in their media diet, you know, whether, whether it's mainstream or alternative media, you know, whether it's Ben Shapiro or Fox News, it doesn't really matter where you are, those issues like CRT or, trans rights or whatever it might be, they become the kind of highlight of the news because people in media spaces know that that's how you rile up a base. And then once once the reactionary base is riled up over that issue, then it becomes this like evolving pendulum swing that no one seems to know how to stop because the only thing that stops it is the next issue. So it's like it's, as soon as people get bored of the CRT issue, you know, there'll be another thing to replace that. And then the media cycle continues. And it really is. It, it's a frustrating thing to deal with. Um, I guess no matter really where you are on the political spectrum, if you care about the issues that you espouse, because it's not that it's obviously not that those issues don't matter. It's not that trans rights or CRT or whatever don't have an impact, but the impact that they have becomes this disproportionate um, rallying cry for political bases to then, you know, just rile up their support over. And it's it's very frustrating to, to have to navigate that. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Let's hop in. Uh, we, we, that was a good, uh, a good, good ramble on some of these like calm and just general issues of language and, and rhetoric. So I think um, we can just kind of run through some of the the critiques, I think, of capitalism, and I'm just interested to know how you generally respond to some of these. I mean, obviously, you, know, you mentioned Richard Wolff. You know, he's one of the most prominent uh, Marxist uh, academics or public figures currently, um, both online and just in, in the, uh, the real world as well. Um, so, like, figures like Wolff and historically leftists like him uh, constantly bring up things like the boom and bust cycle or like the Marxist critique, you know, of the, the uh, falling rate of profit as a kind of signals that capitalism as a system is unsustainable long term. So pick or choose one or both uh, of those issues. When you hear those brought up by leftist critics, you know, how do you typically respond to those? Boom and bust cycles happened in even centrally planned systems. It seems to just be a function of uh, you know, uh, of, of the human condition almost is that if you, whether you've got market orientation or you've got uh, planned economies, it seems like you're kind of just going to have boom and bust, right? Whether they be caused uh, because of the system or because of some exogenous force, right? Like uh, for instance, obviously a huge boom to the, um, or a huge bust to the Maoist system obviously was uh, they had a lot of environmental degradation, right? And so, uh, partially caused by them, but also also partially just the weather of the time, right? They had a big bust in their grain supplies, and part of that uh, part of that was what led to that huge famine. Right, right. Now, most of the reason was their poor distribution, right? So you can't get them off the hook in that regard. Mao, basically because of government policy, led to a lot of people starving to death that wouldn't have otherwise probably ended up starving to death. Um, but that's an example of a shock that would happen uh, whether you're a capitalist or, or, or a socialist or whatever it might have you. Right. So I think the boom and bust cycle cycle is <clears throat> not really as big of an issue as, as you might imagine. And um, if, if anything, I think that part of that shows the robustness of, you know, market economics and sort of capitalist orientation fundamentally is that, uh, yeah, there's boom and bust cycles, but there's not like just bust. Right. Um, you know, you might have recessions where output goes down. 
but it doesn't it doesn't tend to be the case that oh uh, because you have output going down all of a sudden you've got tens of millions of people starving to death and all of a sudden tens of millions of people are homeless overnight right, right? even in the 2008 financial recession when in theory, right, um, this was like the end of capitalism, right? There's going to be tens of millions of people homeless and starving because they lost their homes and stuff. You still didn't see that. Now, it was a huge impact for a lot of people, don't get me wrong, but um, the system eventually recovered is kind of the point, right? Yeah. Um, and, and just to hang on that just for a second, I mean, like you said, I think it's a, it's a great point to bring up the sort of centrally planned alternative, not necessarily having a, an answer for that critique. Um, but is there an answer within, say, social democracy when we talk about the sort of aftermath of a boom and bust cycle like the recession where when we see the sort of disproportionate um, gains and losses like the income inequality expand, you know, particularly with that, like between uh, like black people uh, with like housing, you know, being disproportionately impacted. And we see this kind of just continual gain. Is there besides like just general welfare policy, is there like a answer you would prescribe to, to that issue is kind of like be, it, it, just as, under the assumption that it would be an ongoing uh, issue like every 10 or 15 years we go through this cycle if that were to happen every single time is there a sort of a uh, way to bandage that that so it doesn't become so severe each time for for various minorities particularly yeah. a lot of people obviously but particularly minorities in this case yeah, I think part of it is a paradigm shift uh, in general, right? And I think we we absolutely saw that paradigm shift in full swing in 2020. So the paradigm shift I'm talking about is that, you know, if you if you have a recession because of one reason or another, um, it, you know, the recovery is almost entirely dictated by government policy, which has proven to be able to uh, incredibly quickly uh, sort of advance an economy's recovery, depending on how much they want to invest in in the economy in general, right? So uh, in 2008 and uh, 2009, what you saw was some pretty milquetoast stuff coming out of the government, right? Huge global financial meltdown, right? And what you saw from the U.S. government was a $400 or $400 billion bailout uh, for uh, basically to stabilize the financial market, right? That was the TARP bailout that Bush did. And then you saw, I think it was another $700 billion that was more kind of people-oriented that Obama did. But that was it, right? A trillion dollars to recover from a global financial catastrophe probably isn't enough. And I think that's evident in the recovery, the fact that the recovery took, uh, you know, six, seven years, right. right, in terms of getting back to where we were before the recession. And I think that's obviously just a sign of, of poor government policy. But... What you saw with regard, uh, in regard to the um, uh, the coronavirus recession, which was probably a deeper s sort of recession based on the numbers, right? But probably also a recession that's a bit more recoverable than the financial crisis, um, because it was almost purely just a fluke, basically, that the recession happened in the first place, right? Yeah, it like wasn't some sort of underlying prior to that. Yeah, it wasn't some sort of underlying structure that caused the economy to fail necessarily, right? Um, it was the coronavirus, right? And even in that regard, what you saw was that the U.S. government did $5 trillion worth of stimulus. If you count the infrastructure bill, $6 trillion, right? Um, which is probably reasonable to count the infrastructure bill, right? I mean, that's an unbelievable amount of stimulus. And uh, what did that lead to? Well, it led to us being one of the first countries to recover from the recession, uh, completely in whole part, it led to a historic amount of growth uh, in general. And uh, like I said, a relatively quick recovery. So, you know, that paradigm shift, I think, is important. And it appears to have happened, right, that if you do have a recession, uh, the government really needs to step up in terms of offering support to people who were affected. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, a system that was socially organized would have a very similar problem and could very much suffer from very similar mindsets at the time where, you know, oh, no, we don't we can't like overextend ourselves. We, you know, should be conservative in this regard. And, you know, oh, we, people over there should just cut back their consumption and whatnot. And, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense if, you know, if you ask me. But, um, you know, I, th I think that's kind of what you can do generally to to help fix that that issue. Yeah, the discourse around the recovery um, since the pandemic and, and everything that's followed has been frustrating because obviously, again, you don't want to put yourself rhetorically in a position where you're, you know, saying it's not that bad, 
to people that are struggling economically in the aftermath of all this, but for the people who want to downplay the U.S. fiscal response, it's, it is frustrating because I, I believe, I, I haven't looked at this recently, but I believe that the the U.S. fiscal response to the pandemic, like you said, when you kind of total all these packages together, it was, it was either the, the number one in the world or second to, I think, Japan uh, in total response. It was one of the top countries' uh, fiscal responses. So it's been, obviously, we, we did a lot. And I think a lot of the discourse around it gets kind of muddied because, again, we don't have a universal healthcare system. So a lot of the issues surrounding the response and, and sort of people's uh, desperate situations gets lumped in with that because, you know, it's like, oh, we we can't just get paid to stay home like X country here. But that's one. And that's another thing that's been frustrating to see, because I know a lot of my friends who work in media, like have media jobs where, you know, they can pretty easily work from home, whether it's in tech or social media or journalism or what have you. Um, and, you know, a lot of these people, again, not trying to discount their own material struggles, but they'll, they'll be posting or talking about how, you know, oh, I wish, you know, the government would actually, or, or they'll say something like, I'm glad I got that $2,000 check for the past two years to survive in this pandemic, when in large part, they are able to keep a job and work from home. But I think that, again, it kind of, uh, takes away from the fact that our unemployment insurance is really was like the kind of backbone of a lot of the the economic response from us, which I know tons of people who have gotten thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars from that, which they were in positions where they lost a job or were unable to work due to health problems. And that became super, you know, like an incredible response to them. So it's it's really tough to navigate that. It's hard to it's hard to say, like, what about the, the reality of this response when people, you know, it's very touchy with people because obviously everybody's struggling, whether it is yeah. tied to their job or just their mental health, you know, it's like there's there's a whole spectrum to that. So it is it is frustrating to talk about, but I but I agree. I think that the the response as a whole, there's a lot more to it than like capitalism bad, which is uh the kind of theme here, which is tough to it's tough to grapple with that. It's just like I don't I don't know what the the alternative here would be in your mind, you know. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. And I'm not, you know, that that's one thing when I talked to a creator named Rob Knorr, where this was kind of the back and forth that we had, where he was like, the Biden economy is an unmitigated disaster. And it's like, okay, well, there's like, whatever, like, what, what data, I'm a data guy, right? Like, I like the numbers. I like graphs because yeah. I'm a fucking nerd. You didn't nerd, believe the data, right? so it was useless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's just, I mean, look, may, maybe that's part of my Marxist economics education that I got at university or something. But that that's just kind of how, I, how I'm built, I guess. I just want to see the numbers behind things. Like, the numbers behind the narrative are more important to me than the narrative itself. And, um, and so... You know, what data are you pointing to to say that, you know, the economy is an unmitigated disaster? Okay, well, inf inf inflation is 6 and 7% instead of 2%. It's like, okay, well, I mean, that's fair enough, right? But we also have, like, a, I think it was, like, a record number of people. Like, it was, like, more jobs that have ever been added in the history of U.S. presidents have been added under Biden. Now, part of that's just timing. The truth is, that would probably be the same if Trump was president. Because a lot of people were, the economy was recovering, right? So um, not all of that is based on the stewardship of Joe Biden, but um, this this is the economy you're criticizing, is the Biden economy. That's how you're labeling it, not me, right? right? And so what, what, you know, what data are you pointing to? Like we've had, you know, we, we've, we've, we've got record savings rates. We've got demand recovering at such an incredible pace that that's what's causing part of the inflation, not just the fiscal recovery. We've got... Uh, you know, we, 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 we've got personal consumption expenditure that's that's higher than it was before the pandemic. We've got labor force participation, 98, 90, 99 percent uh, of what it was before the pandemic started. We've got GDP that recovered faster than any other country. Right. I mean, like what what's the number you're pointing to? And he, in general, he had this narrative of like, well, people don't feel like the economy is good. Right. And it's like, OK, well, hey, look, honestly, that's fair enough. Right. You're right. A lot of people don't feel like the economy is doing very well. Right. But the question isn't, you know, it's, it's not even necessarily why are they wrong? Right. It's 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 who is feeling that way and why are they feeling that way? Right. Because you're right. Like there's a lot of people who 
um, did just fine during this pandemic, right? Did better than they would have if there wasn't a pandemic, if yeah. we're honest, because they got they got an extra couple thousand dollars that they wouldn't have otherwise yeah, gotten, right? Jobs and just cruise through. Yeah, and so um, you know, it it, it, it so who who are the people that are saying this economy is going is an unmitigated disaster? Why are they saying it, right? And um, there's a lot of different explanations for that. You mentioned the unemployment insurance. You know, one of the, one of the big problems with one of our automatic stabilizers, unemployment insurance, nobody can fucking get it. Yeah. Right. A lot of the times because it's state administered, which means that Texas and Florida and all these fucking right wing, stupid ass states are going to have different disparate reasons for why they're denying people benefits. Right. Yeah. They a lot of them axed it pretty early too. So. Yeah. And, and so th- th- I can understand why someone in Florida is pretty pissed off after they lost their job and they're not able to qualify for unemployment benefits. Right. Um, but then someone in Massachusetts might have the total opposite experience because that's relatively blue leaning state. Right. Or Vermont or whatever have you. Right. right? And so, you know, the federal system of government, um, I think, does, d- you know, does. D- I-, I like a federal system fundamentally just because lo- local control makes sense for a lot of issues. Right. But it does it does lead to um, a frustratingly accurate and disparate picture of what the country as a whole is like, because someone in a destitute situation living in Texas is going to have almost a night and day fundamental difference in how they interact with the state to obtain benefits uh, than someone who lives in Seattle or Vermont, right? And that's purely based on state ideologies at time at the time. Um, and uh, you know that's uh, that would be frustrating. That would that would be less frustrating if it wasn't people in red states who had the biggest critiques of the current administration, right? It's yeah. like, well, a lot of your critiques might actually be based on state policy, not national policy, right? Um, and it, it's hard for people to understand that you know it's a it's a federally funded but locally administered program. Right. And so, right. I mean, that's that's where you'd end up with uh, the potentially these discrepancies and in, in how they, they view the system. So, you know, that can be frustrating. It's not that anyone's wrong for how they feel, um, but it's really just a matter of, like I said, why they're uh, feeling the way that they feel and uh, r- rationalizing that to them. Right. I think that uh, it, it, I'm, I'm reminded of a I don't recall where I heard this from, but it was, uh, you know, hey, if. Uh, you know, if if you lost your job, if you're in a bad situation, you know, don't look at the don't look at the immigrant, don't look at the other poor person, right? Look up, yep. right? Look at your government, right? Look at look at the the wealthy of society and and how your government interacts with them, right? And that's really what uh, can probably explain more of your problems than you know the the immigrants or the you know the whatever the the the, the, the municipal uh, sort of uh, you know pu- public utilities or something like that, right? So just it has to be more reasonable than that. Yeah, and I think a lot of it comes down to just the tales oldest time of people being more attracted to anecdotes than data and the and the fact that media in particular is able to spin stories where whereas like a journalist and I'm, this is not I'm not an anti-journalist guy, but one of the issues of journalism particularly particularly in some media ecosystems is the fact that you can find any one or two or 10 people on the street, interview them, you know, write a story about how they lost everything or whatever. And that becomes the sexy appeal of a, of a narrative that people then attach to the broader, you know, economic or political state of things. And that's the kind of Rob Nor brain poison in, in my, in my view, like, listen, I listened to that conversation and just the, the trouble he was having separating data from anecdotes because like you said obviously you can't discredit an anecdote when someone is in that losing position because obviously every economic policy has winners and losers so it's like our job to decipher you know who are the yeah. winners who are the losers like what wh- where is the like who who are the exceptions to the rule here like is the rule that 70 or 80 or 90 percent of people are doing great and then five or ten percent of them are doing bad because that's how we can shape you know the most effective policy but that's just not how most people understand policy or data and like a lot of it like you said a lot of it is just vibes like people you know if you you hear people talk about inflation it's just like oh well obviously the economy is doing terrible or you talk to like your local small business owner friend who's saying how they can't hire anybody nobody wants to work and then it's like all of a sudden you get this feeling of like oh well the economy is terrible nobody wants to work you know what's going on and it is really it's really difficult to to get past that you know yeah i mean it 
frankly, it makes a lot more sense to use data to discount anecdotes than to use anecdotes to discount data, right? Now, neither of us are actually doing that, though, right? No, no Nobody should reasonably discount someone's uh, sort of, you, you know, suffering under an economic system, right? right? There were people under a booming Trump and Obama economy that still suffered, right? Um, you know, so, so, you know, if, if you if you go to a homeless person on the street in 2019 or in 2017 or 2016 and tell them, wow, this is a great time to get a job. The economy is recovering. Can you believe all this and that? Well, they're not going to care about anything right. that you have to say, because yeah. obviously, you know, they have their unique situation that is difficult for them to navigate, obviously, because they wouldn't be homeless if it, if it, if it was otherwise. Right. And so. Everyone can have disparate and different gripes uh, for a system. It's really just that narrative that that Rob was pushing and that I think uh, other people push of, you know, oh, no, 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 it's binary. The economy is either doing fucking terribly because there's a Democrat in office or it's doing great because there's a Republican in office. Right. It's like, OK, come on, guys. Like this, this gets a little, uh, you know, if if if, if we're going to have a partisan debate, then let's just have one. Just admit that's what we're doing. Yep. Right. Um but we're not running for office. You know, our goal in theory in a, in a policy discussion with, with a friend or a family member online like this shouldn't be to push an agenda. What agenda are we pushing? We're not part of any, you know, we're not running for anything as far as I'm aware. Yep. Right. We're not organizing a, 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 a nonprofit, right? We're not, we're not running a super PAC. What's the, what, there's no necessary reason to push any sort of a narrative like that. And so, you know, when, when, when you, when you run into such absolutism, it, um, you know, it, it just ultimately is frustrating on both sides because you can you can see them doing it. You can also see your own side doing it, to, you know, depending on the issue. Um, and, you know, it's it's obviously pretty, um, pretty frustrating. But, you know, like I said, all, all you can do is try to make that nuance as, uh, as as sexy as possible. Right. There's been people who have had, uh, you know, good good stewardship of the economy that have that have engaged in, you know, relative depth of understanding with economics and the interactions thereof uh, who have been able to win elections. Um, but it does. It it probably requires an extra step and a little bit harder work in terms of your messaging than than otherwise people would want to engage in. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's a great point to 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 the fact that the cultural wars and the sort of yeah just the the cultural push and pull between left and right. You can't as much as as, as it's annoying, especially to left leaning people, because we know in and obviously everybody would say this, but I mean I would say confidently. You know, I'm a layperson, but I know. You study this very deeply. This is some, this is, these are topics I've followed for a long time, and I feel very comfortable with the current empirical evidence in broadly social de- democratic programs and policies that we would push to kind of get the most um, the most help to the most possible people. Like in the U.S., as an example, with a lot of these like fiscal responses, and we talk about you know whether it's universal health care or you know certain taxation policies or what have you. It's like a person like you or I could know based on the the sort of current state of data that we are in the correct mode that this is going to help the most amount of people. But at the end of the day, it's tricky because when you're talking to most people on the left and the right, frankly, you're not dealing in the mindset of empirical data. You know, you're dealing in the mindset of culture. You know, like a, a Rob Nor or like any, you know, conservative leaning person, when they they even if you told them, you know, I know for an absolute fact, if we raised the marginal tax rate to 60 or 70 percent, you know, we would be able to fund these programs. And if we could fund these programs, it would lead to these great outcomes. We know it is a fact. What do you say to that? They would still have the retort of just, well, I don't want to live in a culture that of people who are, you know, le- like they're leaning on the government. You know, they're they become dependent on the government. And I don't want to give the government more state power like I I need to have a, a strong, you know, opposition to government power it needs to be decentralized. So it becomes this like, diff- it's just difficult to navigate the more you break it down with people. And I think it is important to have that empirical back end, but it's also just as important to at, le- at least have an understanding of those kind of underlying culture wars, because that's how you really break through to most people. You know, it's like if you can break through on that level and kind of address some of those underlying concerns on a cultural level, and then you slip in the empirical data, that's like, the, the, that's like the one two combo, you know, and it's just it's tough, really tough to do that because it can be frustrated when you're trying to address matters on an empirical level and then you're getting hit in the face with these issues that really don't feel as important or don't feel as, you know, fact based, but you have to address them on some level, which I think 
people on the left in particular, like center left to far left, struggle with because you know we we tend to we tend to view things. We're kind of like reacting to people who are reactionary, and it's this like we're we're wrestling in the mud, and it's really hard to get out of the mud because once you're out of the mud, it's like you're not you're not in a position where you can influence you know the people who are still wrestling in the mud. It's it's a weird. It's a weird situation to be in because it's like whether you're trying to come up with a sexy, you know, YouTube uh, headline or whatever, or an article headline, or, you know, you're just trying to get people's attention on something like you're running for office. You know, it's really it's tough, like we're saying, to kind of develop a policy or a a series of content around fact based, nuanced, you know, approaches to these these matters versus the kind of red meat culture war stuff, which is so sexy so we have to like figure out how to, how to how to wrestle in the mud like that without completely losing the the, the function of of the the policy agenda that we're trying to cross so it's 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 a, it's a tough tough space to be in. yeah i think i think it's just trying to you know when you're presenting a bunch of dense facts i think it's important to show that you have a personality as well right and that you're not some some suit you know talking about these things in a very detached manner right, right? um and that can be that can be hard for people um, who are more sort of empirical and data oriented, uh, sort of data driven to 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 come out uh, and do. But it is necessary, right? Because because like you said, you know, you fall into these you fall into these cracks of like basically people just think you're a robot and like you know that's they're not going to listen to you or take you seriously because they feel like you're apathetic to their cause and and what their problems are. And so uh, that that's that is an important issue to you know try and develop yourself as a an advocate for whatever you're advocating for is you know you might have all the stats in the world but you have to be able to present that in such a way that it resonates to people yeah you got to walk the tightrope for sure um yeah and i I know you're you're somebody like i've been saying it's it's been fascinating to watch your channel grow as you kind of engage on on both i know you started out with the kind of goal of being more much more economically focused and now you're you're kind of diving into a lot more of these culture war debates and discussions because it really does it it broadens out your potential audience and your ability to kind of navigate those conversations in a more fun memey way that you might not get to engage in when you're just talking purely about data on something like that so yeah it's a good thing i mean ultimately yeah ultimately i'm really i'm willing to talk about anything um it's just that i'll be you know some some topics are just just so not interesting to me that it it can be (laughs) Because, you know, it's like ultimately with every with every debate that's not about I mean, even even economics debates, I do this. But like, you know, t- typically, unless it's short notice, I try to prepare for all the different discussions I have. Right. And so, um, you know, w- with certain topics, it's like, oh, man, do I really want to commit myself to preparing for this topic yeah. for a few days or a week or something like that. And yeah, sometimes the answer is definitely probably not (laughs) yeah so you gotta get yourself motivated to something that you just have no interest in it's that's tough um yeah let's let's jump through some of these more i guess hot button issues Uh, the next one i had on my my agenda here was how in your view does capitalism and or social social democracy um address climate change and just ecological disaster in general because i feel i feel like this is one of the top kind of concerns that leftists often bring up is the the idea that waste and pollution are sort of inherent to capitalism due to its need for infinite growth and, and you know constantly having to you know colonize and, and draw out resources to to feed its growing need not just for population but for profit so what is your um response to that critique you know in terms of how does capitalism address the environment the answer is that it does pretty marginally, right? So, like, obviously, when we're talking about markets and private investment, um, with or without government uh, involvement, there's going to be some amount of, like, push and move towards being more sustainable and green. There always has been. But it, it it's really a question of, well, will capitalism do that on its own? And, you know, the, the, or, I'm sorry, apologies. Will, will capitalism do that on its own to the extent that the environment, uh, you know, will be protected holistically and the economy will be green holistically. The answer to that is almost certainly no, 
right? That you do need, you need to have government policy to protect the environment and to push forward the priorities of environmentalism, both in a pragmatic sense, but also just in a democratic sense that some people might, that just might be a thing that they vote on and you're obligated to sort of fulfill that interest. And um, to a certain extent, obviously. And so, yeah, you, you, you obviously need government policy. And I think government policy has been shown to be relatively effective and robust. Um, that was one of the things that when I, when I spoke to Vosh that I thought was interesting was that, um, I don't know, I guess I shouldn't speak to that conversation. It was a long time ago at this, it was a few months ago, but, um, it seems like he and, and some other leftists, it, it's almost like, how do I put this? It's almost like policy gets enacted against capitalist wishes. Policy gets destroyed eventually by capitalist lobbying and, and, and ultimate wishes. Right. But this just isn't true when it comes to environmental policy. Environmental policy across like basically every single developed country has been very cumulative in nature, right? That it tends that the environment gets more and more protected over time, not less, right? And you can probably find some instances of governments uh, doing some bullshit when it comes to environmental policy. Like, for instance, a, a very a, a, an example that's happening right now is that the Bolsonaro government in Brazil is uh, basically doing a lot less to protect the rainforest, yeah. right? Um, but... That is but one example. And I think that, you know, th this is one of those frustrating things about anecdotes and, and potential things is that you, know, you, you can find individual examples of the environment not being always number one on the priority list of governments, right? But is it broadly the case that environmental policies become more robust over time? Well, of course, the answer is yes to that, right? There's not any data. There's not any sort of aggregate sort of moves and policies that, that can speak to that, right? Um, you know, carbon emissions in... Uh, the United States, as an example, have been going down since 2000, right? Absolute emissions, if I'm not mistaken. Per capita emissions have been uh, going down basically since uh, the 1970s, right? And uh, the world emissions have been stagnant uh, basically since the for the same period, since the 1970s, right? And so obviously it's the case that government policy does quite a good job at curtailing the negative sort of environmental externalities of market economics and capitalism. Um, and apparently they do a good job sustainably. So, because again, it's not like, you know, it, like for God's sakes, it, even if you could somehow in your head believe that over time, environmental policy has only become worse and worse and worse and worse because of capitalist lobbying. Well, where'd the emissions go? Right. Because you know, what, where are they going? Because they're not happening, right? Now, obviously, we have more of a way to go to decarbonize our economy. But it's just that if this narrative was true, that, oh, like, at the point of inaction, that's like, it's almost like you've been enacted and the next day you've got a death, you know, a, a warrant out for your death or something like that as an environmental policy and under a capitalist system. Well, by that logic, carbon emissions would only go up over time. They would never go down. They would never stagnate on a per capita basis or on a... Uh, on, a, on an aggregate basis, right? But that's what you've seen in developed economies acro across the last two decades and, you know, on a per capita basis across the last five decades, four decades. So, you know, I don't know. I, t I tend to reject, again, that absolutist narrative that, well, capitalism cannot have environmental sustainability baked into it because basically the capitalist elite will always eat away at um, any sort of gains that you can you can make with regard to the environment, Um I don't agree. It just doesn't seem to be bore out um, based on the reading of the data and just basic sort of following government policy over time. Well, the interesting uh, kind of point to, to, to jam in here, too, is that a similar argument is often made about welfare policy being, quote unquote, stripped over time, which I know you've talked about empirically not being the case that particularly in the U.S., I mean, welfare policies have largely expanded since um, like the New Deal era. But I think Part of the the leftist critique to to the point you just made on both the welfare front and the environmental front <clears throat> would just be it's not enough, you know. Like they would say it's not enough, it's not quick enough. So, like in the example of welfare, okay, so let's say welfare hasn't been stripped by lobbying and capital interest the past few decades. Well, it still hasn't broadened to the universal level where people are covered and and we're curtailing a certain degree of poverty and, and, and death and ailment among people who are in need. Same and same with the environment, you know, okay, so we're slowly, you know, getting greener and, and in, enacting these kind of carbonization or decarbonization policies uh, in the U S and around the world. However, scientists say we need 
X decarbonization, you know, in the next 10 years or else there's going to be irreparable damage. It's not fast enough. So what is your kind of response to to that? Like, it's just not enough, not fast enough uh, to, to either or of those arguments. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the standard, I think that the last thing that I saw was that we have until 2050 to really complete this task of decarbonizing the economy. And a good portion of that needs to be completed by the end of the decade, uh, by 2030. Mm-hmm. For, for one, I'm not really sure why that's the case, but for, that's what I've been hearing, right? That's what it's I've read. It's probably just um, like the trend, like, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. For some reason, it's not perfectly linear and it can't be. So, you know, you've got to front load a lot of that, mm-hmm. right? And um, I don't, I don't really know. So how do I put this, right? It is understandable to assume that the environmental progress that we've seen, if continued, will not be enough, right? Um, Because if we assume that the environmental policy of 2030 will be fundamentally the same as it is in 2020, then of course that makes sense. But what we're assuming is that policy won't change at all. Right. Um, right. The IEA released a, um, and I don't want to quote the numbers exactly because I don't have them in front of me, but the IEA, uh, the International Energy Agency, released a report. They do a, a yearly global energy report. And I think that they said that based, uh, what they had was a graph, and it was like based on the announced policies of governments, this is how much like we cover net zero by 2050. And I think it was like 40, 50% of the way there already. Don't do anything else. Just the announced policies, right? 40, 50% of the way there, right? And so I just feel like the idea that like there would be no further subsequent push for environmentalism or, or, or in fact, no technological advancement in that time doesn't really make a lot of sense. Look at the state of Tesla in 2012. That was eight years ago. Compare it to today, right? Yeah, it's insane. It's, it's an ex- yeah, it's an explosion, not only of Tesla, but also generally an interest in, in EVs uh, across the, the world. It's like, it's like, you know, you hear about the, uh, the, the chicken sandwich wars where like every single fast food restaurant's like trying to come up with the best chicken sandwich right. ever. Um, there's going to be EV wars that are going to happen throughout this decade. Ford, uh, you know, Ford, Chevron, G, uh, you know, GM, right? Uh, all of these companies are, you know, Toyota, Honda, all these guys. Uh, they're all competing right now, spending hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in aggregate to produce the most efficient and best electric vehicle that you can, right? And so, the idea that the, that that you're you're going to see the exact same trend of the last decade into the subsequent decade, I don't really think makes a lot of sense because, in a lot of respects, the market mechanisms by which our economy is governed actually are working. Right. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that that's kind of where, you know, where I would put it. I saw I saw a job posting. It was today. And I get, uh, you know, I get, I get a I, I sign up for like job emails. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, hey, you know, whatever. Th- these jobs are available. Right. And I saw that Shell was looking for a I think it was literally called like a decarbonization advisor, like a guy that, that's you know, comes in, tells us how to decarbonize, tells us how to be more environmentally sustainable, right? Why would they ever hire that position if the socialist narrative for these companies was even an, an inkling correct? Right. Why would they ever, why would they ever, why would they ever pay someone? And th- this was a corporate advisor. I'm sure it pays six figures. I'm sure it's got great benefits. Corner office. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking it too, up too much, you know? But the point, the point is though, is that like, and, and some people might say that that's a small thing, but like, it's just the, the socialist narrative is so complete and absolute in its thing. Why would they hire these positions? Why would they pay someone 40 hours a week to advise on this? If they didn't at least take it a little seriously. Right. Um, it, it, it's not to say that shell is some altruistic company. They're doing that because they feel like government, their, their expectation is that government policy is going to become more and more strict with regard to decarbonization in the future. They want to front load that. They want to get ahead of that. Right. If corporations just controlled the government, why would they have that built-in expectation? Right. Right? 
And, and there's, and there's so, I mean, the people yeah. demand side of it as well, which is like, like you're saying, there's obviously the, the more investor demand. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I think I, I understand the leftist critique of that because obviously it's not something you want to rely on because obviously you can have demand, you know, talk about Nazi Germany, you can have large demand in a direction you don't want the, the sort of market to shift in. But in the case of the kind of dance that we're talking about between state regulation and market forces, it is interesting how both of those trends are going in the direction you're talking about, where, you know, people as consumers are driving companies right now to be all these progressive ideals, whether it is, you know, accepting yeah. of trans people or, you know, being more environmentally friendly. You know, these are demands being really led by the market. And then it, it becomes a kind of dual force then, like you're saying, where it's like, OK, companies have to get ahead of regulation and the expectations of, of state policy while they're also trying to appeal to a broadening consumer base, particularly yeah. with young people as like the kind of next generation well, to, of consumers. To be clear, though, it's not led by the market. These policy, you know, these these investments in green energy by these oil companies and, and decarbonization efforts by, you know, relatively high emitting companies wouldn't be happening if it wasn't f foundationally underlied by government policy and democratic sort of public push for these things to be happening, right? Um, and so it, it's it's not that Shell deserves a lot of credit for doing that, right. right? It's really just to say that the the narrative itself that government policy is ultimately a farce because corporations control our government because we have capitalism and this wouldn't happen under socialism. It doesn't make any sense because that's not what that's not what's happening. That's not actually the dynamic that's at play based on data, based on empirics, based on sort of foundational understanding of market mechanics and whatnot. Number two, there's no reason to expect that these, these same dynamics wouldn't happen under socialism, right? Oil doesn't suddenly become worthless because you have a socialist system. You're still incentivized to cultivate that resource, right? Um, and, you know, so it, it just, the, that, that critique just fails in so many different ways. And, um, y you know, it, 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 it can be frustrating because I, I, I do remember talking to Vosh about this and I remember getting a lot of feedback from his audience where, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive, but obviously you tend to focus on the, the negative course, feedback yeah. and, and the, the negative feedback was, um, Oh, Econoboy actually expects corporations to do the right thing. It's not what I'm expecting. You're just expecting that the government's always going to do the wrong thing. Right. Right. And that's, what's not true. Right. The, the, the democratic governments, especially these wealthy sort of liberal democracies, standard sort of developed countries. If you look on a map, what's, what would you consider a developed country? These high income countries, Right. Um, that are also democracies, to be clear, they tend to actually be pretty democratic, right? And it tends to be the case that government policy does tend to reflect how people feel, right? Um, sometimes to the detriment of people. Look at Brexit, mm -hmm. right? Brexit's not a good thing. Nobody who knows shit about economics or, or, or sort of, you know, has a, has a sort of a, a, a good sort of grounding philosophical framework would think that Brexit is a good thing. Right. Um, the business elite certainly didn't want Brexit. What what business elite wanted Brexit to happen in aggregate? No. Yeah. All the major donors and all the major corporations did not want to restrict the free flow of goods and services for, and, and the free flow of people between the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe. That is not an interest that the big business elite had. Right. The new elite. But people voted. <laughs> yeah. But 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 people voted for it. Yep. And despite the sort of academic wisdom that was saying that Brexit's a terrible idea, people voted for it. Despite the same academic wisdom and donor sort of lobbying that didn't want this to happen, the government did it. The UK is not part of the, the, the EU anymore, mm -hmm. right? Despite all of, all of that being true. And so, you know, it's, it's, and that was an extreme example where the institutions at play very, very much almost almost universally did not want this thing to happen like whether you're a right-wing business person or a left-wing business person nobody wanted brexit yeah if you're in that group of people right um and, and, but it still happened right and so i don't know i just i i think that the lack of faith in the institution of democracy especially in countries with very well-developed institutions um is wrong Right. And I think that capitalism as a means to pro to to generate wealth and government as a means to distribute that wealth and ensure that it's 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 created an equitable framework is that it's just a pretty good system.
right? So that's why I, I just I really I don't like the idea of of um, you know we we have our our system is so broken that we need to overthrow it with this other system. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. Our right. system's actually working out pretty okay. And I think that speaks to another largely counterproductive and inaccurate uh, claim or issue that leftists have gotten into the trend of online, which is this whole anti-voting sentiment, which is really frustrating because it reminds me, I went through this kind of uh, annoying, enlightened centrist phase in like 2015 for like, I don't know, about a year. And I remember wow. it was terrible, cringe. It was very embarrassing, very cringe. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, looking back, specific, I can think of at least one specifically. I know it was, it was more than one, but I can think of this one time I posted on my personal Facebook page, some cringe thing about how, you know, both parties are bad and, you know, like something along the lines of like a both sides ism. And I had several of my leftist friends at the time commenting on it. We got in this big back and forth being like, this is such a bad take, you know, both sides aren't the same, blah, blah, like, you know, this is, this is erasing, you know, a lot of the, the, the power dynamics that we struggle with in culture. And now, a lot of those same leftists are doing the both sides meme. And they're saying, you know, both parties are the same. It's all rigged. You know, there's no purpose in voting, because we don't get our interests across. And it's so frustrating, not only in the face of the the current um, the Biden administration, where a lot more has gotten done, frankly, than I imagined would have gotten done within the first you know couple of years, but just generally speaking, to to the point you're making about our inst- our democratic institutions, it's like it's such a inaccurate and difficult point to grapple with because it fails on almost every empiric. You know, it's like you have to like really really get down to the most extreme. Uh, policy demand, like we've been kind of going over this whole time of like, oh, we didn't get, you know, Medicare for all today, you know, to to be able to make this kind of no. like groveling, well, both it, why does voting matter? I didn't get exactly what I wanted. And it's really difficult to to navigate that critique as well. Yeah, just because it's like, we try to talk about these specific issues and where they differ between left and right policy prescriptions. And it just feels so discouraging, especially for young people who obviously historically are, are the, the least likely demographic to get out and vote in the first place. And these are the people we need to get out and vote to get across, you know, a lot of these yeah. progressive policies. So it's been so frustrating, especially the past year to watch this trend among uh, left-leaning people to just really be like, you know, screw voting, man. None of this really matters anyway. Like the climate change is going to kill us all. And we're never going to get Medicare for all. So why does it, any of it matter? And it's like, man, that is yeah. not how you encourage a, a voting base to to get out and, and actually get us the majorities that we would need in Congress to, to pass this legislation. I remember something I realized that I thought was an interesting point was that anti-electoralist people often, obviously, would encourage you to independently organized, you know, oh, work on union organization, mutual yeah, aid, mutual right? Aid, yeah. Right. Um, but they they decry the efforts of people that work within electoral frameworks. You know, you know what I've noticed? No one who works with an electoral framework would say that it's dumb to organize a union or that it's dumb to offer mutual aid. Right. No one. No, no one who, 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 you know, knocks on doors or simply goes out and votes or tells their friends to go out and vote or, or, or collect signatures for a candidate. None of those people would have a problem with mutual aid or, or organizing unions for the most part, obviously. Um, but there's this weird anti-electoral bend that you're right is, is very weird. You know, boycotting elections typically just doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Especially, especially in countries with really strong institutions, like I'm saying, right. Um, for instance, um, uh, during Reconstruction, when the South was admitted um, into, uh, readmitted into the Union after they seceded, um, they the the South ended up sending black elected officials to Congress. Well, how, what the heck? Why? How? How does how does the South go from fighting a war to enslave black people to electing black people to go to Congress? Well. The answer 
is they boycotted the elections, right? And so, you know, it, 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 there's many examples like that across history where, you know, st- incredibly stark examples like that where, like, nobody wanted, in, in those regions, nobody wanted black people to be elected. Mm-hmm. They wanted to enslave black people, right? But, yeah, like, boycott all you want, kick and scream all you want, but this is how we determine who's in the government, right? Yeah. And because the government has such an ability to move policy and... Um, and, and, and resources fundamentally. I mean, there's no, there's no corporation that makes, you know, four or $5 trillion a year, right? That's, that's what the government collects in taxes, right? It's no, there's no, there's no corporation that comes even close to that. Right. And so, you know, the, the ability of the government to move resources and to enact sort of their will upon people is unmatched, right? The monopoly and violence and just the ability to move, uh, parts of the economy and distribute them to other parts is unmatched. And, we're lucky to have a democratic framework where we get at least a say in what that looks like. And so uh, the system is relatively effective uh, and it tends to follow the median voter. And uh, so that's, yeah, I agree. It's, it is frustrating when people say that, you know, you shouldn't vote or voting is pointless or it doesn't matter who you vote for both sides are the same. It's like literally none of these statements are true. And um, you know, you will, uh, you will continue to be irrelevant to the process by which uh, you have your most criticism uh, because you refuse to participate in it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, whether whether they feel this way or they just don't care to do it, um, tens of millions of people agree with those people, yep. right? I mean, we had record high voter turnout in a record, like re- in a relative sense, like we had an incredibly high relative voter turnout in 2020. And uh, it was 67%, right? So we had, you know, a third of adults um, just, you know, just sat it out. Yep. Didn't, you know, didn't, didn't want to vote for one reason or another, whether it was because it was a principal position they had or because they just didn't care to. So, you know, that is a real problem. Uh, and, you know, all, all you can do is try and push back as best you can and try to show people that the... Um, that in, in, in fact, your material outcome is very much uh, ch- uh, changed and reoriented depending on government policy. So, you know, you should have a, an interest in that. Yeah. And I think you kind of hinted at this earlier, the sort of um, even barring the accelerationist impulse, uh, knowing that like, you and I knowing that like uh, historically and, and just basing it around, you know, other examples around the world, the sort of accelerationist outcomes are always a disaster either way. Um, but even if saying they weren't necessarily a disaster, the U S economy, the state of things as they are, as, as, as much as like we're saying anecdotally, there are people who are struggling and so on. We're just nowhere near a a, a desperate state where an accelerationist movement would have any kind of impact on our, on our, our system. Like it's just not even, I mean, those, yeah, those those accelerationists that thought that Trump would would lead to people becoming class conscious and get socialist selected, you know, who who do we elect in the eighteen midterms? Bunch of liberals. Yep. Who do we exactly. elect in twenty twenty? Exactly. Joe Biden. He did. You know, Joe yep. Biden. Bernie did worse. He did worse in the twenty twenty primary than the twenty sixteen primary. You know, and so it's ridiculous that type of of rhetoric accelerationism it's I, i'm not sure it's a bore out anywhere it's certainly not bore out in the united states right turns out when you elect right wingers they do right wing shit and then that's it that's the you, end of the story right how do you yeah, <laughs> yeah. To kind of removing it one step so like not accelerationism but like general populism from like a leftist perspective how do you feel about populism as a sort of rhetorical strategy knowing that obviously like you said bernie both in 2016 and 2020, um, was outperformed by his moderate counterparts, um, but still was able to, to generate a, a massive grassroots movement. And in many ways, uh, which obviously I know a lot of leftists are still unhappy with, uh, with our, our liberal Biden, but in many ways, Biden and the campaign trail still adopted some of those, that more populist uh, rhetoric as well. You know, this kind of just, we, you know, we're the people and it's just this, this kind of, I know there's extreme versions and moderate versions of, you know, the kind of like us against the elites or whatever, and that can get cringe on the on the extreme ends. But do you think populism in any extent is a viable rhetorical messaging strategy? Or do you think largely it's just uh, 
kind of devolves into into chaos or or shitty outcomes. I mean, it's undeniably effective, right? It's certainly a viable we rhetorical know it's effective, strategy. But is it good? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, but that's obviously that's a different question. Yeah, I mean, obviously it works. Um, is it good? No, I wouldn't say so because, you know, when when you find yourself criticizing a generic elite, um, that rhetoric is pretty easily co opted by bad actors, right? And and that's you know that's not a good thing for you or obviously for society. And so, you know, I don't I don't really like that in general. Um, if you're going to criticize an elite, you know try to be relatively specific with who you're criticizing. Right. And, um, if, if it's, you know, like when Trump criticizes the media, he gets a lot of criticism. Um, when left wingers criticize Fox news, they don't get the same kind of criticism right? because you're not criticizing just the entire institution of like the, the dissemination of information, right. Known as the media. Right. Um, you know, uh, because that's a lot more authoritarian than 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 just criticizing a news channel specifically, right? OAN, Newsmax, you know, Fox News, right? The these these sort of institutions uh, are are sort of individually criticized, right? It's sort of like it's the difference between like I might criticize Donald Trump, and that's one thing, but if I just criticize the idea of having a president, right? There's there's a whole different sort of set of of connotations that come with that. Right. And so I don't really think it's positive. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to the extent that it can be avoided and you can still achieve electoral outcomes, it should be um, because, you know, y- y- you want your base to support you a- as much as they can. But I think ultimately what you should want is for your base to support you as critically as possible as well. Right. That. Mm-hmm. You like don't want like holding you some, accountable, essentially. Yeah, I mean, you don't you don't want a a, a you, you don't want people to follow you blindly if you're being, you know, basically if 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 you are genuine as an elected official, you shouldn't want people to follow you just blindly, mm-hmm. right? Um, because if you've run on a platform and you're unable to get that platform elected, you either have some explaining to do, and it could be very rational explaining. Obviously, like for instance, Biden, very rational explanation is. Yeah, I just don't, you know, I don't have the votes, right? There's many dynamics at play, so I don't have the votes for some of the things I, I ran on, right? Um, some things he doesn't have an excuse for, which is another conversation. But with those things, um, yeah, you've got to accept the consequences potentially of people uh, not being inspired to vote for you or otherwise, right? But uh, I think appealing to a sort of ge- generic populist rhetoric can be, you know, quite quite dangerous. Ultimately, it's it's kind of the easy way out for a lot of people, Um and uh, hopefully in the, you know, I, I think I think we've seen some sort of general political moderation as a result of, you know, of Trump kind of exposing a lot of the, the flaws of that rhetoric where it's like he's, you know, I'm going to drain the swamp, but then I just make the swamp 300 times larger than it was. <laughs> right. Or, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take on the media, but I just contribute to an incredible polarized media that, you know, probably was better before I was was in charge. And so. Uh, you know, a polarization. You know, it's it's like fighting fire with fire, populism with with polarization. So, uh, I I think that uh, it's it's not necessarily that we'll see a moderation, but uh, maybe in the future we'll see maybe less demand for that type of, of populist rhetoric going forward. Yeah. Do you? So you, we kind of touched on this earlier, but there's this. You got me thinking in terms of um how largely a lot of these these things we're talking about, whether it be environmental, labor, you know, just general progressive leaning policies that have gotten more much more popular in recent years and, and the kind of which is great, you know, for people in our position of trying to kind of shift the Overton window toward social democracy. There's this one criticism which I I was just thinking about that left that um as soon as like left wing policies get established and, and uh, that I know we talked about this earlier with how the kind of rumor or the, the sort of myth that welfare and environmental policies get rolled back by capitalists. I know that's not the case, but there is this kind of meme that capital and, and I, I largely agree to this to some extent, like you, you mentioned this around the um, environmental issue that on its own, on its own capitalism, you know, would not be, prone, you know, to, to curbing, you know, emissions or whatever. So 
in terms of capitalist interests and then the kind of like opposition to those interests, you know, as we kind of move into state policies, whether it's, you know, uh, Medicare for all or some environmental regulations or what have you, do you think that there's any merit to the idea that, you know, as leftist ideas and movements continue to grow, like they have in various points of history over the past century, that capital interests will always fight back even within the sort of social democratic framework. So like even if we talk about Norway or any of these, the various uh, like countries within the Nordic model, um, is there merit to the idea that like over time, capital interest, I mean, there's always going to be that tension there. As long as we exist within a capitalist system, how do we, how do you address that criticism is insofar as you know we could get all these these problems kind of like i guess one example of this to, to give it some legs i'm sorry i'm trying to think through this how i'd frame it but one example would be i know that um income inequality is is on the rise i believe like i don't know if it's for the first time but it's it's trending in in some of the nordic countries i believe currently you can correct me on this point but Idea being, you know, there's certain things being stripped away or capitalist interests that are kind of fighting back on some of these policies. So how do you how do you approach that in, the, in terms of being like an ongoing tension as, as long as we exist, even if we get like every country to be a social democracy, there will always be that kind of tension within the capitalist class and the working class to kind of roll back or fight against, you know, interests of people. Well, I think that fundamentally what we're talking about is competing hierarchical interests, right, with regard to government policy, right? And those same structures don't go away in a socialist system, right? They just become called different things, right? If if you had, you know, for instance, if you had a market socialist system where everything was sort of cooperatively organized and there's a social wealth fund that's investing, um, all of us, you know, instead of corporations, it's just the different competing cooperatives that would have right. uh, their own special incentives to, a biased government policy in their favor, right? You just hope that they wouldn't do that because hopefully your democratic institutions are savvy enough to to deal with that. And over time in the U.S. Um, and in most developed countries, they've been able to to remedy that, right? The median voter is typically who's represented in a democracy, not the median sort of corporate elite executive or whatever, yeah. right? Not the median shareholder of a corporation, right? Um, and um, so that, that's how I would counter number one is to say that those same types of pressures would probably exist in almost any socialist system, especially if you want that system to be democratic, right? It's almost more of a criticism of the potential precariousness of democracy, even though that, you know, precariousness doesn't tend to exist um, in countries. In theory, voters can still vote, you know, for issues that would do damage to other people or society at large. Well, but also just, you know, if, if you own like, the the whatever, if you own the oil cooperative, if you're a worker who owns the oil cooperative, what incentive do you have as a worker owner of that company to make it more environmentally friendly? Right. You don't. You have the opposite incentive, right? You still are incentivized to to argue and negotiate with the government and to lobby the government in your favor, right? Let's say you have a situation where your country at large is an oil wealthy country, right? Most of the money coming into your country and generated from your country is from oil. Let's say that this country now all the oil companies are cooperatively run. What has fundamentally changed that would cause this country to all of a sudden become more environmentally friendly? Nothing. Nothing has changed, right? There's all the same incentives at play. You still need government policy, and you're still relying on an aggregate democratic say in government policy to move that company forward. It's the same in a capitalist system, right? That's that's really the, the, the main argument. And until someone can demonstrate to me that, oh, um, you know, at large, our entire government, you know, or even the majority of our government policy is dictated by corporations rather than the generic will or interest of the people, um, then it's it's an unconvincing argument mm. to me because it seems like based on, uh, based on the polling data and based on the interests at play and structures of the government, it tends to be the case that the median voter is represented and reflective in policy. There are some exceptions to that rule, seemingly, but um, the relationship between money and lobbying and sort of actual policy outcomes is very tenuous. Um, it's not clear. And, um, you know, there's there's smarter people than anyone 
listening to this or you or I that are working and, and trying to unveil this issue and they haven't really been able, not that they're trying to, it's not that they have motivated reasoning, but you know, there, there hasn't really been this, this big discovery of like, oh my goodness, uh, it turns out the median voter is not represented at all in government policy. And it's basically just this big corporate elite, right? Yeah. Again, if that were true, we would see a drastically different state of, of, of governing with regard to our environment and with regard to our social policy than we do today. And that's not what we see. Um, so that's, that's kind of in, in general, how, how I would respond to, to that critique. Yeah, no, that's good. And and even going deeper beyond the sort of profit motive that would still exist within market socialism, and even just at the pure demand level, you run into really similar issues. I mean, there's, there's that whole meme of that people will be like, Oh, well, whatever it is, it's like a hundred corporations, uh, control or account for like 70% of global emissions. And it's like, okay, well, that's a demand issue. I mean, it wouldn't make it, it wouldn't make much of a difference. In fact, it could arguably be worse if it were 10,000 companies be much harder to regulate, you know, those 10,000 versus the 100, um, in that case. And, and it's largely due to the demand of whether it's those products or services or, or whatever. And those don't just go away within a socialist system. I mean, there's still going to be demand for, you know, excess food and, and various products and, services that would still be having to like be justified within a system so it is kind of you can run it down and, and run into those types of problems e even if a socialist would argue okay well it's not as bad without the profit motive or or whatever i mean it's still you're running into comparable issues of demand um with or without it i think that's a good point is that you know even if you've even if you had a system that's decommodified and you know everything is collectively run to a certain extent, right? You, you still have those, those, that same sort of basic demand, like, Hey, if quality of life goes up when I use oil, right. I'm probably going to naturally be incentivized to use it in general. Yeah. Right. And so you need some sort of organization with a monopoly of violence with some sort of collective, um, you know, determination, um, that, uh, can, you know, issue those, those, uh, individual, sort of preferences, right? Obviously, you know, that, that is a very weird statistic that gets thrown around because it's like, oh my goodness. So, because it's weird because uh, it oftentimes comes around when people, when you, whenever you see uh, like encouragements of personal sustainability, like, right, hey, right. you know, recycle, or if you can afford it, buy an electric car or, you know, do this and that to help the environment. Somebody's like, man, why the fuck would I do any of that shit? I, all these corporations are doing all the polluting right. in the first place. And it's like, <laughs> Okay, so let's just go down to basic parenting. Uh, just because Johnny's acting like a dickhead doesn't mean you do, right? So generally, just because a corporation's polluting doesn't mean that you should or you should not care about your personal carbon footprint. That's number one. And number two, obviously those corporations aren't just evil. They're not just producing products that fuck the environment because they want to. They're doing it because there's a market demand for the products they create. And the most efficient way to produce those products is the current systems by which they produce them. And so I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying that obviously consumer choices are what's dictating fundamentally a corporation's action. Right. Um, and, you know, unless you if, I don't know, unless you even think that companies don't even listen to their own consumers, which I don't know how we could arrive at that conclusion. <laughs> That's even harder to arrive at. But in general, the point would just be that, um, you know, obviously there's a personal responsibility thing out there, but government regulation, you know, throughout this environmental discussion, it just has to be restated that government regulation in any system is going to be a primary driver for environmental policy and sustainability and setting the culture of environmental policy and sustainability, right? Um, for instance, in my own state, um, the phrase don't mess with Texas, that sort of famous phrase of texas don't mess with texas was originally a government-sponsored anti-littering program that's wow, where that phrase that. came from <laughs> yeah that's because it was like hey don't mess with texas by littering right. you piece of shit right so <laughs> that's where that phrase originally came from so there's 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 obviously a role for government in either system um and it's as an inherent critique of capitalism i just think it doesn't it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me yeah yeah i'm with you on that for sure that was Good discourse. Um, I feel like we're, we're pretty far into this thing now. Um, we can kind of feel it out from here on out. But I do feel like um, I do want to touch on what we teased about earlier, something I know you've done videos on and had discussions over, the sort of uh, really primary critique, primary leftist critique, I should say, of social democracy, which is this idea that, well, I guess it's kind of twofold, right? The, the one end of it is that 
social democracies require imperialism slash colonialism uh, in order to kind of prop up, create, sustain their economic model. Um, and then that sort of largely is, is part of like an ongoing project with exploitation, primarily in the global south. So what is your kind of general, you can go as long or short as you want on this, but I, and I know you've done the research. So what's your kind of general take on that? So the research that I've done um, leads me to the opinion that it's not a necessary component of of developed social democracy to exploit the third world or the global south or developing country, like whatever phrase you you might use. Basically, the video that I did was actually relied on a relatively strict set of assumptions that were generous towards the socialist critique, right? So what I assumed in my video was, let's just say... Every single time, every single time that the global South sells something to the global North, every single one of those interactions is purely exploitation. Let's, let's assume that. That's absurd to assume because you're assuming that there's literally uh, no negotiating power from smaller countries to other countries. For instance, when, you know, when, when, Indonesia sells, when an Indonesian company sells something to a company from Liechtenstein, like just generally we might assume that the Indonesian, the Indonesian company might have more employees than Liechtenstein has people right. for fuck's sake. Right. So there's, pro- <laughs> there's probably some negotiating power, but let's just say, you know, whatever, right. Let's just say that every single time that any country from like the underdeveloped world um, or the low income world sells something to a higher income country, it is exploitation. Okay. We've made that assumption. How much of the economy is that? The answer is four to four and a half percent. Right. Most most recently available data of the most recent year. Now, that's a pretty astonishing assumption or that's a pretty astonishing fact Mm -hmm. for most people to to barter with, because some people assume that trade is a much bigger portion of the economy than it is. Trade is is not a big portion of almost any economy in the world. Um, If we think of China, right, China is like, oh, well, they manufacture a bunch of stuff. Everything's made in China, you know, classically. Mm -hmm. Um, their economy is 20% exports. 20%. Now, that's not to say that if you just got rid of the export market of China, they wouldn't be fucked. They would be, right? Because that's a huge yeah, portion of their manufacturing exactly, base yeah. in their economy. Yeah. So, for instance, to put it in perspective, um, the global financial recession in uh, 2008, the global north experienced a recession of 3.5%. So you know, four, four, five, four, four and a half percent of economy is not a trivial amount, but what was the response when we had a global financial meltdown that caused three or 4% of our economy to get wiped off? Well, we recovered the following several years and eventually supply chains and sort of the governing framework and apparatus adjusted to the point that, you know, we don't today it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not really a particularly relevant issue. The 2008 financial crisis, right? It's more of a historical footnote at this point, mm-hmm. not something that we, we really consider on a day-to-day basis, right? And so um, my only point would be that let's just say that we stopped trading completely with these countries, we would see a recession. It would be a bad recession. It would be difficult, right? But would we see fundamentally all of these welfare states and all these social assistance programs and all of this government spending and programs? Would we see the democracies of the, the the bourgeois democracies of the social democratic countries of the world, but we see all of them erode and all these institutions erode fundamentally because of this cutoff of trade. No. And there's no reason to expect we would see that, but that's not even what people are advocating for with social democracies. We're not, we're not talking about cutting off trade. We're actually arguing for a much simpler process, arguably a much more sort of malleable and, and, and accomplishable process which is just bringing those countries to parity with the global North. Mm -hmm. So fuck cutting off trade completely and losing four or 5% of your economy. Let's just bring these countries to parity and let's see how that affects the economy. Let's do it over a long period of time as well, because it's not going to happen overnight. And the reality is there's no reason to expect that if we brought these countries to a developed standard, to a sort of basic consumption expenditure, that they would necessarily collapse uh, the global North because of that, right? Country A becoming richer does not cause country B to become poorer. Um, it's not necessarily the case that if we reformed those supply chains, that they would, um, that, 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 that the economies of the world would, would collapse. For instance, two good examples would be that when China and when India started to industrialize and become incredibly, incredibly 
like in a relative sense, more wealthy than they used to be. All this huge economic growth that these countries have sort of independently had under two different governing economies. Did the entire rest of the world become poorer because China and India became wealthier? No, of course not. Did the other countries in the same regions become poorer because China and India became wealthier? Also no, right? Um, there's like a genuine real terms decrease in the number of people who are in poverty because of the development of these two, you know, uh, in, in these two countries that collectively have like, you know, almost 3 billion people in them. So that critique is, it just doesn't make any sense to me in general. And I don't really think there's any reason to uh, assume that a, basically a, a, a social democracy is necessarily today exploiting a bunch of people in the global South. Um, and when I say necessarily, that's a, an important word is that it's not necessarily the case that this has to happen. The second conversation would be, will it ever reform in general? Right. Which is, which is different, but um, yeah, I think uh, that that's, uh, that's where I'd leave it. What do you think about just the kind of front end of that question? Cause I agree. I think that's all, those are all salient points as to the sort of idea that no, the imperialism, colonialism, exploitation, et cetera, are not necessary to create a social democratic framework. Um, what do you say about, the sort of way it's developed thus far? Because you talk about, like, ideally, and I'd be interested to hear if you kind of get into this. I'm not sure if I've heard you speak to this before, but ideally, we you know, we bring develop these developing countries up to to the same, you know, social democratic framework, standard of living, um, et cetera, and that, that kind of benefits everybody. One, in the process of doing that, do we, like, is knowing that we've built the current social democratic model, I think... Um, I'm not a fan of the guy, but I think Jason Hickel, uh, the anthropologist who has a lot of uh, critiques, which would be interesting to get into maybe at another time, just uh, about kind of like green growth, the idea that like what we were talking about earlier, that sort of under a capitalist framework that a lot of the decarbonization and, and, re and regulation, you know, just, it isn't enough to, to curb you know the climate disaster or poverty rates or what have you. I think he, he has a like a quote in some article, I don't have the exact number on me, but it's somewhere around like $150 trillion that the, I don't know if it was the Nordic countries or just the global North in general has extracted from the global South in the last few decades, which I, you can educate me because I don't even know when I, when I hear the number 150 trillion, I don't even know how much that is really in proportion, you know, for, for, for over the, over the course of several decades or whatever. But um, knowing that, some large number, some very large number uh, that the global north or Nordic countries have extracted from the global south the past few decades to kind of get to where they are. Moving forward, is there a sort of like more concise rebuttal as to saying like that portion of building this economic model is not necessary for other countries that would then try to start something like this more from scratch as to where the other Nordic countries may have been 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah. The thing about Jason Hickel is that he always quotes absolute numbers because they sound really big because they are big, right? A trillion is a, an incomprehensible concept for most people to think about. Right. Um, however, uh, if you actually looked at the proportion of the economy that he's talking about, uh, it ends up, uh, his paper actually expels this out relatively clear. I'm surprised he even included it because even, even in his abstract for this paper, um, he includes, from what I recall, the the absolute amounts. Um, that 150 trillion over that same period of time ends up becoming about seven percent of the total economy, right? And he he's not mentioning that that proportion of the economy today stands at around three percent of the economy, oh, wow. as he defines unequal exchange, right? And so, it's not that this isn't a problem that we should take seriously, right? It's just that. This unequal exchange is not the bedrock of any developed economy. It, it's not. It just isn't, right? It, it, by, ab by absolute terms, it sounds like a big number, because it is, to be fair. But it's, it's, it is not the bedrock of the economic system. And using unequal exchange as a justification for upending the entire mode of production that we find ourselves in, it's not, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Right. It's it's not evidentiary. Right. It's not it's not a it's not holistic in its analysis fundamentally. And so, you know, I I, uh, I don't really 
care. Uh, J- Jason Hickel's writings on e- unequal exchange are useful because actually, if you assume, if you if you take all of his own sort of Marxian assumptions of uh, of his paper, and not, I'm sorry, not of his paper, but like he basically he he's he's a guy that you wouldn't reasonably consider to be biased against socialism, right? right. If you asked him, he'd probably say he's a socialist. If you asked him, he'd probably say he's a Marxist, right? Even under his own framework, right? It turns out it's about three percent of the economy, right? And uh, so you know, I I just I reject that uh, that that sort of statistic, or not rejected, but I, I uh, you know the actual proper framing of that statistic is that it is a relatively small proportion of the economy at large, and so there's not really a reason to think that if we engaged in trade agreements and and multilateral action that would lead to a more sustainable development and sort of, you know, equal playing field between these countries that we would necessarily see the, um, these countries, uh, uh, we, 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 we would necessarily see the, uh, currently developed countries become, uh, sort of poorer because of it. Um, for instance, between, uh, between country inequality, right? So the, the inequality that you see amongst nations, right. Uh, has actually been going down for the last 30 years, Right. Um, and again, under this framework um, of, of Jason Hickel and many other socialists, that wouldn't even be possible, right? It, w- it would not be allowed to happen. The CIA would just overthrow your government right. or something like that, right? Um, but it, uh, but that is what you see. So, you know, and these countries are becoming wealthier and they are pulling people out of poverty, um, you know, uh, in one way or another. So, you know, I, I, that, that framing is... Um, is a is not it's it's a problem, but it's not a reason to overthrow capitalism, and that's uh, that is true with a lot of the descriptive facts that socialists uh, espouse in their advocacy. Well, I'm glad I brought it up to you because I've seen that headline, that number tossed around a lot in these discussions, and I, like I said, I, I've always been, I get drawn in pretty easily by things, so I have to kind of always catch myself, you know, when I see something at face value, like how do I take a step back and like put this in proportion. But I'm also not an economist, and I'm not a great numbers guy. So I knew bringing this up to you, you'd have some kind of uh, re- response to it, which really helps kind of uh, remove the the compelling enchantment of these these giant ass numbers that get used as you know viral headlines. It's like, oh my god, like look at this massive number. But then I think about, it, I'm like, well, this is tracking like over decades of time, and I have no idea how. I'm not an economist, like I don't know how to measure. Th- this this amount of value over time or what these numbers even mean within context so very helpful uh, and i appreciate that um just kind of uh, going off of a lot of these topics talking about empirical data and economic efficiency and you know which system which models um lead to the best outcomes i I know that, you know, you're basing your sort of worldview around like the best available information that you can come across. But obviously, I w- from messaging you before oh, we had this conversation, just some of the, the rough ideas of what I wanted to talk about with you. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up was just the fact that we don't purely measure like the success of a society based on economic outcomes. Because if that were the case, you know, people could argue that the Soviet Union was successful in a lot of ways because their economic output, you know, at their peak was imp- highly impressive. And that we, but we obviously know whether it's, you know, the Soviet Union, whether it's the United States under slavery or various other points of his- in history and around the world, just pure economic output doesn't necessarily mean equitable, you know, outcomes for, for people across a society, whether it's minorities or just working class people in general. So, when you think about social democracy and the sort of models that you um, you base your worldview around, like what other factors do you consider when talking about the best like model, the best the empirics? You know, do you do you talk about or do you think about happiness? Do you think about um, income inequality? Like, what are some of the other factors that you consider outside of just pure economic outcomes um, when you think about that? I would say. Um... I think the human development index is something I looked into that I think has some decent metrics in there. So like you might look at access to electricity, access to uh, years of education, quality adjusted life years, infant mortality. um, You know, uh, what's it? What's the um, 
it's it's not a it's mortality associated with um childbirth so uh, infant mortality. You know, well no but infant mortality is when the children die i'm talking about when the mothers die I, i'm mm-hmm. not sure if there's a different word for it but you know that that's sort of health care um you know st- stuff like that access to a, a primary care physician you know there's there's all kinds of different things that you can look for that um uh, maybe maybe it's called maternal mortality, but there's all kinds of different things that you can look for to try and assess the sort of basic quality of life of people outside of just GDP. I mean, GDP is the final cost of goods and services, right? That's what it is. And on a per capita basis and in an aggregate basis, it's not necessarily the case that when that number goes up or when that number's high, uh, the quality of life of citizens is going up uh, generally or if or necessarily that, that that growth, apologies, is equitable in nature, right? So... It's uh, it is important to look at those more uh, th- those those other sort of basic things that uh, that are important for day to day function that uh, people should should hopefully uh, you know should should hopefully account for in, in their analysis for like is this system at large a good system um, and is uh, you know and and if 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 you don't see those metrics panning out uh, under your system. Um, is it a problem with the system itself or is it rather uh, an adjustment of the system that needs to be had? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that all makes sense. I didn't even like, I mean, I'm an idiot. I should have considered, you know, some of those more, you know, baseline, you know, access to, to food, water, electricity, and all that. That's, those are pretty important, I guess, <laughs> on, the, on the broader, the broader scale. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that index um, later on. Well, dude, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to have this conversation with me and kind of break down, some of these talking points and, and just general arguments. Um, I guess just to to wind down here, um, when you look at the, because you're in the U.S., I'm in the U.S., you know, when you look at the current political landscape of where we're at with, you know, whether it's the Biden administration or the next, you know, five to 10 years, you know, what are, I guess, like a handful, you know, whether it's two, three, four mainstay policies that you're, that you think are like both pragmatic, but also, you know, like great enough to, to really like put a dent within our system to kind of move it in the direction of social democracy. Um, do you have like, and I, I don't mean like generally, I mean, obviously, you know, we all want some kind of health care, but do you have like a specific model or policy around health care or education or any of these other areas that you, um, you feel strongly about? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's becoming more and more excusable every single second that we don't have some sort of universal health care in America. Um, and I would say that kind of a top priority for me personally would be a public option health care. I think that that's pragmatic. I think it's more likely to get passed than single payer health care. It would still have an incredible benefit. We have a framework for that policy already. So obviously a public option in this sense could just be Hey, if you want to buy into Medicare, you can. Yeah, just expanding right? it. Right. You know exactly. So, um, and that's uh, something that I think could get passed. I think it would be wildly popular. I don't know who would be against that. Yeah. In ter- like, I don't know what real fucking human being would be against that. Is what I'm trying to say, right? Obviously, the Rand Paul and Ted Cruz's of the world are <laughs> against that kind of thing. Right. But, um, you know, I think once you explain it to most people, most people would actually be pretty down with that. And. Uh, so I, I would personally like it like that to be seen as a policy push. I think that was a big blind spot of Biden in his first year was, um, hey, you're just coming off the back of a big health care crisis. Maybe, you know, that public yeah. option should have been a, a bigger push. Um, at least that's my my view. But he, he decided to focus more on infrastructure. And that's I mean, whatever. Every you know, they all have their own shit that they do, whatever. And um, so. That would have just been my thing, though. I think that would be the most transformative thing. Actually, um, w- when is this podcast going to be released? Oh, well, ASAP, probably the next you know, couple of days. Okay, so I won't, I can't come out with, uh, well, based on saying this, I cannot come out with a, an official endorsement, of course. <laughs> but my, uh, my policy tournament is down to the final two policies. It's been six, seven weeks, 128 policies in this policy tournament. And, um, we we are down to two, and it is public option versus net zero emissions, Ooh. and uh, public option versus net zero by twenty thirty, which is what some people have a problem with. You know, a lot of people like me might say, um, "I love net zero, but by twenty thirty, super unrealistic." Short term goal, public option makes way more sense, right? right. Just, and just um, pragmatically, yeah, yeah, and um, it is 
Uh, it is super duper crazy close. 48 to 51 <laughs> or 48 to 52 right now. Retweet it if you can. Advocate for whatever you want. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know when this podcast will be out. Ho- hopefully I don't bias the results. But, yeah, I, uh, I'd be more uh, really more of a public option guy generally myself uh, in, in terms of the, those two options. And that's the one that I would really focus on. Other than that, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I would say other than that, I'm a huge worker board membership guy as well. I really think there should be some sort of a policy that says, you know, if you're above, I don't know, if you're if you're above um, if you're above 50 employees, you should have at least a third of your board be workers. And if you're above 500 employees, it should be 50 percent, mm. like something like that. I think, think that, that there should, should be forced be... or encouraged through some means like a like a like a tax deduction or something. Or how would you enforce that? I think it should just be a rule. Mm. Um, it should just be required. And because there's not a lot of like investment or like structural concerns with just putting workers on boards, right? It's not like you're changing the equity structure of a business. It's not like you're altering the capital markets of the economy by just having workers provide input and votes on boards. Um, but I think there's a lot of empirical evidence that this um, decreases alienation between workers and managers. It tends to increase worker benefits and pay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think generally mo- more workers would feel satisfied if they felt like they had a, a you know a seat on the board with actionable policies. And um, I think this would also encourage things like unionization, and it would probably have more extrapolating effects. And so, if I had to pick two, if I had to pick literally just two policies in the next two years that I'd want to see implemented, it would probably be some sort of a regulation on worker board membership, and it would also probably be a public option that is a uh, you know paid for with some sort of a you know, it's paid for with some sort of a tax or a payroll tax or something like that. And because mm-hmm. obviously you have to pay for whatever the public the public option would be relatively expensive. So something like that, I think those two, those would be two of the things, but there would be, there's much more than two, but if I had to pick two, I think those would probably be it. Yeah. The taxation model could be its whole, a whole string of conversations. You know, what are the most effective taxes to implement for something like that? It's a long, long standing debate between all the, between, you know, whether it's marginal, you know, rates individually or, you know, uh, um, what do you call it? capital gains taxes? There's so many different like forms of taxation to, to consider when paying for something like that. So that's interesting. I think you, you have videos on that, I believe. So I can send people your way or do you yeah. have videos on taxation? Yeah. I'm not, I can't think of any after the top of my head. I do. Okay. I have a whole tax playlist on Good. my channel. I think Good. I'm a, Three or four videos deep in the taxes. I've covered Nordic taxation, capital gains taxes, and corporate taxes. So maybe uh might do more in the future. Everyone and their mother wants a land value tax video. <laughs> Don't know where land value tax became so popular out of nowhere. Twitter. That's one. And then uh uh I might I might eventually do a VAT video as well. But Very uh cool. Love it. And I love the know. work the worker board membership idea. I think that's that's something a trend that I, I talk with a lot of uh, friends of mine who work between media and uh, marketing jobs where, you know, there's this kind of broad trend of millennials and Gen Z who, d- as a kind of demographic whole, aren't loyal to companies anymore. You know, young people would jump, you know, 5, 10, 15 jobs uh, throughout their careers. And, you know, you got boomers and Gen Xers critiquing young people like, oh, you know, you're just not loyal to any companies, it's like, well, young people don't really have a reason to be loyal to companies anymore. And maybe if they actually had some like worker representation and say in the companies that they, they work for, that would, that would be different. I don't know, but we don't have a, a very strong, I mean, currently there's a labor movement happening, but you know, there really hasn't been a much of a, a strength in labor over the past few decades to, to give younger people a reason to commit to their companies, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely agree. I mean, that's, um, um, well, I think that in general, that's typically a kind of standard advice that I would give to any person sort of fresh out of college is, you know, honestly, um, don't stay at a job too long. Right. Is, uh, if you like it, look, if you want to be fucking paid what you feel like you're worth, honestly, you should probably in the first 10 years of your career, you should probably switch jobs at least three times. Mm. Right. Um, and it, it look, if only for the reason, then, um, uh, you get, uh, promoted faster and you get raises faster for God's sakes. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's tough when, um, 
um, you know, I, I, I had a friend who he got, uh, basically he would go and get, uh, competing offers for, he would go to basically the, 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 the other company that competes with theirs and, he, uh, they would, uh, they'd want to recruit him. So they'd offer him more money. And, you know, when annual raises come around, it's always, you know, oh, yeah, two to 4% kind of thing, whatever. We'll throw you a little something inflation right. adjusted. Right. And, and, but then all of a sudden he gets an offer for, you know, 10,000 extra dollars. And the boss is like, oh yeah, I'll match that. It's like, where did that right. come from? <laughs> yeah. It's like you dickhead. Have you been underpaying me this whole time? Yep. He's done this at the same job within the last four years. He's done this three times. Genius. <laughs> and it's it's worked every single time, which is unbelievable when you think about it. Like, it, like because think just for people listening, think about this from like, I don't know, just think about this from your perspective, right? It's like, I just, like, I, I you know, when I asked for my merit raise, they offered me 4%, which is relatively standard, just a little bit above inflation. Or maybe they just offered me inflation. Mm -hmm. And, um... I offered, you know, and, and that's what they fought me on. That's what they ended up settling on was the two or three, four percent, whatever. Right. But then I go out and get another offer. You know, all of a sudden I'm a pretty valuable employee. All of a sudden, yep. all of a sudden yep. you got to pay me to keep me around. Right. And so, you know, there are some people and oftentimes they're 45, 50 years old who will say, oh, that's terrible. You're going to develop a poor relationship. It's an awkward relationship. And it's like, whatever, man, look, OK. I get that. I really do. I understand it. Like it doesn't, it does lead to like a more tenuous relationship between you and your boss. It makes having and cultivating a long-term relationship with your boss, like a little harder, but is, is being underpaid for the, for 10 years really worth being a little bit more friendly exactly. with your boss. Right. I mean, that's really the, that's the problem. Right. And it's a market you have to compete. Right. And uh, you know, when you're selling your labor, you know, you're, you're competing with other sellers of your labor just as much as the corporation is competing with other buyers. Right. And so, you know, when you can do stuff like that, I think it, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I think, you know, uh, you're, you're right that worker board membership, stuff like that might alleviate that problem to a certain extent. I think it's, it, um, it, uh, it would probably just lead to, like I said, just generally like more satisfied employees were like, Oh yeah, you know, we get a say in how the company runs and, stuff like that to 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 a marginal extent of, of course so yeah and there has like you said there has to be a tension there between labor and, and capital and it's like it's it's interesting in the wake of the pandemic and the the fiscal response to it kind of leading into a lot more power behind labor it's like people are finally starting to realize you know their value to a company like i think a lot of workers just don't even fully grasp the sort of uh, importance of employee retention for a lot of companies just how, how difficult it is to bring somebody new on, have to retrain them and all that. And I think it is really important, especially for young people, to be cognizant of that and then be able to, to, to leverage it as needed throughout their career. So I think that's really good advice. Yeah, um, yeah I agree. This, this has been great, man. I really appreciate, like I said, I think um, I appreciate the time. It's been I, fun. Yeah, you're, you're one of the the brightest prospects in my mind of uh, YouTube and just online political creators in general. Just I really, I agree. <laughs> I just, I, I greatly, I, I think that you're, you're sort of a combination between like empirical data and like, and wit and ability to kind of roll in the mud sometimes with some of these more debater style, you know, extremely online types, which kind of, you know, a lot of these guys drive the culture. And I think you're, willingness to engage with them across the spectrum and lay out your uh, your ideas um, primarily for social democracy or just it's great it's much needed in the space and uh, really really appreciate you not just taking the time to talk to me but taking the time to kind of go through each of these issues and have an actual thought process that you've you know considered research and it's not just something that you know you read a couple articles about and you're like oh yeah I've got I've got this very strong opinion on this because I'm an yeah. idiot, and most people like me are idiots. <laughs> you know, like I just I'm joking, but like lay people. You know, like I'm not an expert in really any of this stuff. I just I do my best to follow the most credible sources I can. So it's it's important. You know, when I come across guys like you, who I can tell based on the sourcing that you do with your work that uh you know you, you put the work in, and it's it's good shit. So I, I really appreciate you coming on and educating people, and I'll I'll definitely 
direct in the show notes a link to your channel, which has a lot of deep dives into some of the topics that we just touched on here. Yeah, no, for sure. I agree. It was really fun talking to you. I had a good time and I hope the viewers enjoy it. Let me know when uh, you release it and I can boost it as much as I can. Uh, And it was a fun time. Good talking. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Econo boy. Talk to you later, bud.